talk today a little bit um, about fawn health. I think that that's just a topic that we can't talk enough about. Uh, we'll move into some gut health and then some things that we can do to keep babies and deer alive once they're on the ground. And then we'll wrap up with uh, some anesthesia, um, just knock down and sedation. And then I have other talks if people want me to go through those. But the bulk of what I would like to focus on today is fawn health and gut health um, and just trying to keep stuff alive once we have them on the ground. So I think as deer breeders, um, you guys want to know how can you get the most amount of babies possible on the ground out of the matings that you want and how can we keep those alive. So if we're looking at the doe, we're asking her to give us the appropriate number of fawns um, and then we're asking her to take care of those fawns and it's our job to help her do that. And then we want those fawns to reach an age where we can market them, either sell them to someone else or keep them back in our pens uh, to get reproduction and production out of them. And so I look at this kind of like a bank account, really. Um, if we draw a line in between the third and the fourth uh, loss here, you know, run up to breeding, which is prep for AI or prep for your cover bucks, the breeding time, and then early pregnancy. I look at all those as deposits into our bank account. And then in the fall, or I'm sorry, spring, here in a couple months, all of our babies are gonna be born. Um, and I look at that as our starting fund in our bank account. And so I think the reasonable question to ask is, what can we do to put more money into that account or to get more babies on the ground? And then once we have that there on the ground, um, what can we do to save that or to keep as much of it there as possible? And so we're gonna talk about things that we can do to either maximize or conserve uh, that bank account or that investment that we're gonna have on the ground. So we'll talk about what we can do pre-breeding, what we can do at AI time a little bit, and then how we can maintain those pregnancies and maintain those fawns once we get them on the ground. Uh, starting off kind of slow, getting our gears going, we're gonna talk about some definitions that I think are helpful when we're talking about AI success or reproduction success. And so conception rate's easy. That's just the number of animals pregnant over the number of animals uh, bred. And so, you know, if, if you have 75 pregnant does out of 100, you have a 75% conception rate. You can take that a step further. I think this isn't something that everybody does, but in my opinion, a more important number is your fawn crop percentage. And so that's incorporating not only your preg rate, but how many fawns per doe you have. And so if we look at this example up here, we have 100 does that we bred and that of those 100, you have 200 fawns on the ground. That's a 200% fawn crop, which is stellar. Uh, that's not realistic, but that's stellar. Um, more realistic would be if we go back to that 75 pregnant does to AI, over 100. Each of those gives us twins. So you have 150 babies on the ground. That's 150% fawn crop, because you have 150 babies out of the original 100 that were bred. So it incorporates your preg rate and it incorporates um, your fawns per doe. So this is just an example how you can figure out that number. You lay everything out there. Here we bred 61 does, 47 of them fawn to, the, to AI. So that's a 77% a fawn rate. And then you add up your singles, twins, trips, and quads. We have 94 fawns on the ground over the 61 does originally bred, which puts us right there at that 150, 1.5 uh, fawn crop. So I, I personally think that that's a realistic expectation for every farm um, that does laparoscopic AI or any type, but 1.5 uh, fawns per doe is what I shoot for or tell people that they could realistically expect when it comes to a repro program. Um, it's not worth looking at all of this if we don't talk a little bit about money. Um, these are just rough estimates. If my numbers are off, uh, tell me. But I just started with a $5,000 average for a doe. Cost of owning her, uh, as far as feeding, is about $400. Again, if, if I'm off, I'm not buying feed every day, but this is how I figured that out. Um, I figured three pounds a day on average per doe. Seems like what a lot of my clients are feeding, 365 days a year you got a 50 pound bag of feed that costs roughly $8. So you're at $175 a year for feed, roughly. Um, and then you can see I did the same thing for hay there, a $18 bell of alfalfa. Um, depending on where it's coming out of, I think they usually weigh 75 to 90 pounds. Um, so 
roughly that comes out to 395 to feed a doe. Um, we'll put that back over here in 400. You have some other miscellaneous costs, artificial insemination, a third of a $2,500 straw semen. Um, the second year of owning that doe until you get babies on the ground. And so roughly, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but my math is showing you got about $7,100 or $7,000 invested in a doe before she gives you babies on the ground as a two-year-old. You can move that up a little bit if you breed her as fawns, but on the average, um, I think this is roughly where it's going to put you. <clears throat> and so you can just start to do some math. Um, if you got a 200% fawn crop out of 100 does bred, you can see the initial return on investment. Um, and then if you drop that down to 150% or 100% fawn crop, and so this is just some quick math that you can look at just to kind of see dollars and cents on the table as far as figuring out where your money's going and, and what we can do to maximize uh, those losses or increase those earnings. Uh, this is just a different way to look at it. Um, things that we can do to increase that fawn per doe average. So if you look at ranch A, there's 50 does bred and we had 1.3 fawns per doe. So that gives us 65 AI fawns on the ground. If we call that a $3,000 animal by the time we can sell it, um, you do math, that's $195,000 on the ground. Farm B, 1.7 fawns per, per doe, not a whole lot more, uh, just 0.4, but that gives you 20 more fawns on the ground. If at the same value, you're looking at a $60,000 difference um, in, the, in the value of the babies on the ground. And if you put that back over the number of animals that we, that we bred, you know, that's like $1,200 value in each doe that you're working with uh, that could be maximized if we're doing everything right to bump up that fawn per doe average, even if it's just a couple decimal points. And this is just some more math that you can look at, but I was just trying to hit home little bitty changes in percentages here and there um, can make a big difference as far as revenue loss or revenue earned or kept. And so you can see there the preg rates and playing with the different mortality and how that can affect uh, earnings and then or how you can manipulate preg rates uh, with the same mortality and just some different earnings that we could be looking at or losses. And then obviously we want to make sure that we're getting the right type of babies. And I put this up there because um, when it comes time to AI season, I think a lot of breeders tend to put more emphasis on the cover buck than on the AI itself as they so they're the AI and then after AI they'll move dough around so that, that dough can be with the right cover buck. And if like we talked about, if AI is working like it should be, you should be at 70% or better on your conception, which means that the cover buck's only going to get to breed 30%. And so in my mind, let's hedge our bets towards those AI babies, because those should be our more valuable ones anyways. Um, and so I put this up there to remind people, at the very latest, when we get to Cedar Inn, uh, those, fawn, those does should be in the same group that they're going to be in until they fawn. No moving those does around because we want them to be with a certain cover buck. Let's hedge our bets towards the AI and hope that that cover buck doesn't get to do very much work. Um, and it's a lot better to be in this top column where we have more fawns out of our AI buck than our cover buck than if you move down and you look at um, potential value if you have a 50-50 split or if the, if the cover buck's working more than he should be. Just, those are just a little bit of definitions. Um, we're gonna move into talking a little bit about the doe and what her job is in this picture and how we can help her do her job better. And so if we look at the doe and what we're asking her to do, like I said before, we're asking her to give us the appropriate number of fawns. Um, the way that she raises those fawns and gives birth to them is a little bit different than how it happens for us in humans. And so we need to pay attention to that when we're born, we get all of our immunity from our mom. Uh, she can pass that to us while we're in utero, while she's pregnant, um, and we start off in a lot better place as far as immune function goes than a newborn ruminant. And so because of that, we need to pay really close attention to the first couple days of health in those fawns. Um, after those babies are on the ground, they need to nurse colostrum. That's where they get their immunity, and then we need to inoculate their gut. Uh, there's a lot of research about how important gut health is to overall immunity, so we'll talk about managing that. Uh, we're gonna talk about some quality 
and quantity of colostrum and things that we can do to maximize both of those. So nutrition's huge. Uh, so we'll spend a little bit of time about that. There's a lot of stuff on here, but uh, the take home message is um, nutrition has a huge impact on not only reproduction success, but also immune function and livelihood. So you can see here what happens um, if we're off on our mineral deficiency, if we have obese animals, if we're malnourished, and if we're feeding excessive protein, which I think is something that happens commonly in this industry. Uh, a lot of stuff on the right. I've bolted the stuff that I think should pop out and hit us as important. Uh, overall, you're going to see lower preg rates, less fawns per doe, um, and lower livability and survivability if we're not hitting all of our markers when it comes to nutrition. So um, I have a bunch of clients that when I first start getting to work for them, I ask them about their nutrition program. And um, right, wrong, or indifferent, they kind of feed the same thing all year long. and so. I put this graph up here to show you that you don't have to do that. Um, if you look at the left side of the column, I don't know if you can see it from here, but this column right here, it doesn't work. Um, far left is maintenance, meaning that's just a, a normal doe that we're not asking her to do anything. That's about the same as early pregnancy. Um, that's after we've weaned her, where she, the only thing she has to do is live. She's not raising a baby, she's not growing a baby, she's not nursing, she's not getting ready for AI. That's just her basic needs. If you flip over here next to the far right, uh, that's early lactation. And you can see that the energy demands between a normal plain Jane doe and a doe that's early lactation, that's almost a two and a half increase in energy. Um, and so if we're feeding these does the same amount every single day, um, we're either overfeeding them at some point or underfeeding them at another point, and at the best case scenario, we're losing money in one of those two areas. And so feeding should fluctuate up and down depending on what we're asking that doe to do at that point in time. You can see here maintenance. Flushing is what we call a nutritional flush leading up to AI. Um, I have some graphs we'll go into later, but basically we're sh we need to increase the energy or the feed to that doe to tell her, hey, um, nutrition is good right now, you can go ahead and have twins. Um, and the ovaries respond to that. And so if we change our feeding a little bit, we can start to maximize that fawn per doe ratio. Early pregnancy, the third one is really just like maintenance. There's not a lot going on in that doe. And so December um, or late November, depending on when you breed, you can really have a lower limit of feed that you're giving compared to that late pregnancy um, and early lactation. And then we start to see we're climbing. Um, the lighter color is your singles and the darker color is if that doe has twins. And so you can see the drastic increase in energy demand almost two and a half times from maintenance. Um, and then it starts to, to back off. And over there on the far right with that lighter column, you can see that if a doe has a single, um, by the time she's in late lactation, late summer, her energy needs are really back down towards uh, maintenance, and so you can really back that feed off. Um, and again, if you, if my math was right on that eight dollars per bag at three pounds a day, um, you can save quite a bit of money over the course of your herd if we're feeding less or more, depending on what the doe is doing. This is a feed chart that we give to our clients. I have copies of it if anybody wants, but um, man, it's blurry. But this is just a life cycle. So the male female sign. Uh, right here is AI day. And so on the left is leading up to AI, and then on the right is uh, everything that we're looking at before. So um, just showing you that what we think the dough needs to have, whether it's uh, increased protein at certain times of the year or increased fat and decrease, and just kind of a life cycle to look at the whole picture for the year, because I don't think it's the same every single day. Um, and so. Well, people say when it comes to feed, more is better, right? And that's not necessarily the case. Um, Overconditioned females is a, is, is a real struggle. We want to increase fat at certain times of the year, but we don't want them to be fat. Uh, we don't want them to be fat either or maintain a high level of, of, of overcondition. So fat cells store some of the same hormones that we're using in reproduction, so you can interfere with those programs that we're asking our managers and pen uh, managers to do. And so if we have too fat of animals, um, I don't see it a lot in the white tail, but I definitely see it in my cattle clients. 
uh, that just interferes and everything starts to drop again. You're gonna have lower egg quality, lower ovulation rate, um, lower preg rate. It's gonna affect the semen quality of your bucks if your bucks are fat. Um, and so uh, we need to be increasing our body condition but not maintaining it at a high level. And I drew this graph uh, to try to explain to you what I'm talking about. Um, if you can imagine the brain looking at energy level as a picture, uh, not just a certain point in time. So imagine that we have a doe that is eating the exact, she's eating as much feed as she can eat every single day. Like you've, you literally could not get her to eat any more than she's eating. And so if you look at an energy curve or how much energy she's consuming, that line is flat. It's way up here at the top, but it's flat. And it looks very similar to if a doe was starving. Um, because that energy level isn't changing any. And so although the does themselves will look very different and what they're eating is very different, as far as a picture of a curve, um, a fat doe that can't possibly eat any more is that top line, which the shape of it looks just like that bottom line, if that makes sense. Where we wanna be is this middle line. So we have does in late lactation and then we wean and then we start to increase the fat. And so what we're doing by increasing the fat is changing the shape of that line. And that tells the brain, if you look in nature, mama says there's grass on the ground, I got a lot to eat, I can afford to take care of babies, multiple babies next spring, I can go ahead and have twins and release two ovulation sites and hopefully both of those become pregnancies. So um, I put that on there to try to emphasize it's the shape of the curve, um, not necessarily how much they're feeding or eating every day. And so we want to be in this middle where we're increasing fat coming to AI and not just letting them eat as much as they can every single day. Um, another thing that I think we see in the whitetail industry is too much protein. Uh, people think, and not wrongly so, the quality of, of feed is associated with the protein level. Um, and that's true to an extent, but it can be dangerous because our body doesn't store proteins like we store fat. And so the only thing we can do with proteins if we reach a threshold limit is excrete it. Um, and that's through urine, through feces, or through other bodily secretions. In the dough, um, it can change the uterine environment as excretions from proteins are acidic. And so if we have too much protein in our feed, uh, we can change the pH in the uterus, which makes an unhappy environment for those early pregnancies, which is going to then uh, affect our preg rate. And so I think as far as a doe diet goes, Doc, tell me if I'm wrong, somewhere between 14 and 16% is an adequate uh, protein level for these does. That's not to say that you can't supplement with something that might be higher, but as, if you balance the whole ration and you look at everything that doe's eating, uh, that 14-ish percent I think is a really happy place for a doe, especially at time of AI. Um, when we're in late, lac late gestation, early lactation, we need a lot of protein. But as AI time, um, we can do harm if we're giving that dough too much protein. And so back to these feeding life stages, depending on what that dough is doing at that time of year, uh, she should be eating something different. And so I, we talk about body condition scoring. And if the doughs are skinny, then that's when we can pull them up on uh, pull them up on energy. If they're a little over conditioned, we can pull them off. If, uh, if we wean the fawns, they don't need as much feed as when they were nursing. If you have a doe that you pulled the fawn, she doesn't need as much feed as a doe that is raising babies because come time for AI, um, she's going to be over conditioned likely depending on when she had those fawns. Donors and recipients, how we manage those if you're doing ET programs, and then does that are uh, raising singles versus multiples. It's hard to separate them. In an ideal situation, you would. Um, that's not realistic when it comes to whitetail, uh, but it is something we need to think about as far as energy demands. So the big question to ask is, what do I feed and when? Um, 30 days pre-fawning, you come into March, April, uh, we really need to increase the protein. There's a tremendous amount of skeletal growth that's going on in the uterus. That dough can't eat enough uh, to provide for those, and so that's when we have to increase the quality of the feed or the protein level. Uh, same thing with early lactation. There's a tremendous amount of protein that's going into milk um, and that she's passing on to those babies. And so 
pre-fawning and early lactation, we really need to be focusing on protein. As we head in towards late lactation, like that energy curve was showing you, we can back off a little bit, start to lower the feed, um, so that come time for AI, we can bump it back up again. So late lactation, we're coming down that curve. You can start to feed them a little bit less. Weaning through AI, we're gonna switch. We're not talking about protein anymore, we're talking about fat. And so there's a lot of fat supplements you can put on there, a lot of energy supplements. But once we hit that time of weaning and we're moving back towards AI, we're gonna switch our focus to fat. And we're gonna increase that fat because that's what the brain's looking at. Uh, when I say energy, I'm talking about fat. And so that's what we're gonna focus on. And then winter to pre-fawning, you know, November to March, uh, really, we're not asking a lot for that dose so we can pull them back off feet a little bit um, compared to what we're gonna give them in late gestation and early lactation. I would, I would up it before they get here. Uh, like last trimester, I would start to up it, and I would keep it up until it gets really hot. Because um, that's, I would, you know, July, when they're getting older and they're a little bit more independent and not nursing our mamas quite as much, then we can switch to our focus on fat and energy. Um, but we'll talk about colostrum quality, and a lot of that is based off nutrition. And so I try to get protein in there at a higher level about 30 days or so before they fawn uh, to help the doe and to help them. And I know that, I know that this sounds good. I'm, it's different in a management situation because you got big bulk feeders, um, but this is just, the, in a perfect world, this is what would happen. Um, and, if you, and then that's why they make top dresses and supplements, but um, I just wanted to lay this out there as something to think about. I know that it's a little bit different based on every farm and, and how your feed programs are set up. Uh, one thing that I don't think that we do well in the deer industry, I did see a mineral booth out there, um, is mineral supplementation. So if you look at any other sector in, in the ag industry, um, they have lick tubs, they have salt block, I mean they have everything. Um, different ways to offer mineral to these animals. And as far as cost goes, it's a great way to lower feed costs because if our vitamins and minerals um, are associated in our pelleted ration and our, and our t uh, textured ration, the only way that those does can get more vitamins and minerals is to eat more feed. So if we can pull that out of the feed and offer it to them in a lick tub as a loose mineral, we give ourselves the ability to offer abundant vitamins and minerals year round without having to feed them extra feed. And so uh, that December to March time when we're not asking that doe to do much, if she just has access to vitamins and minerals and good quality hay, uh, we don't have to feed her near as much as if uh, we didn't have a loose mineral option and she was having to just eat as much feed as she can to get that. Same thing with um, as we're coming down lactation. It just gives us options if we can leave mineral out there for them to eat any time of the year. We don't have to feed them all the time. And uh, we have some clients in different parts of the country that um, there's a couple months of the year where they don't feed any feed at all. They just have a mineral, a mineral source um, and good quality hay. And so as far as cutting feed costs, there's a way to do that, but um, it does come with some management changes. So this is a picture of Again, it's blurry, but that's just a mineral source that we offer. Um, it's pretty, pretty useful tool. This is just a cement mixer, but if you have a loose mineral source, uh, dependent, regardless of where you got it, uh, we have clients that'll mix Bovatec in here, which is a coccidiostat. You can put that in at higher concentrations and put it out in your pen so that your fawns can come lick it, um, and they can get that. You can put. Uh, medication, other types of medication there, but this is a very useful tool. Um, if you have the hands to do it, you can do a lot with a cement mixer and loose mineral. And it doesn't have to be fancy either. These are just PVC pipes um, with some rebar frames. You can pour mineral out in there. Uh, this is a mineral feeder that's just uh, tied to a sapling. Uh, they can fit on a T-post too. Um, but if you just think about 
what we have to do now to get our does more vitamins and minerals if it's associated with the feed versus what we can do if they have access to that year round separate from the feed. We can really start to fluctuate how much we're feeding them uh, without affecting the quality of their nutrition. Sure. Um, yeah, palatability is a big deal because a lot of, the, I mean, it's salt that you're giving them, and a lot of them start to become bitter. Um, I think the biggest issue is it takes a little bit of manipulation with your feed rep because in order for them to really hit that mineral like they should. Uh, you have to take the mineral pack out of your feed. Because if the feed's there and still has a, a, a mineral or vitamin pack in it, they're already salt satisfied. And so they're not gonna go hit the mineral that's available for them. Um, and so you should be able to ask your feed rep to say, hey, uh, can you just hold the mineral, vitamin mineral pack from the next batch? Uh, it should save you 40 or $50 per ton. Um, and then they're not getting salt from their feed, so that'll let them go hit whatever it is in front of them. I don't know if, if that was, if that answered your question, but I think a lot of it is if they're, if the mineral's in the feed as well, they're gonna go to the feed first, get salt satisfied, and then they're not gonna come hit the mineral that's available to them. Well, I just was curious, because I've tried this one that I've talked to a lot of breeders that have. So, I just wanted to see if you guys understand if they put mineral out there. No. It is, a, it is, you do have to work with them to start eating it. Um, and I think the big thing is making sure that the salt is out of your feed. Uh, as far as palatability goes, I think, I honestly, if you just have a mineral, so I don't care what brand it is, uh, if there's just something in front of them and you can get them to eat it, um, that's better than not. And so I know that there's a, uh, it could be a sheep and goat mineral. I'd do a goat mineral, not a sheep mineral, because I think that deer need a lot of copper. Um, but. I got clients on Vitafirm cattle mineral. I got clients on uh, Sweet Licks uh, goat mineral. So whatever it is, uh, I would if you can get them to eat it, um, then I, I don't care what brand it is. I just I think that it's important. Some more pictures. Not much about. I have a whole talk on water quality. I think water is the most important nutrient, and it gets overlooked. Um, but these are just some different waters, especially in fawns. Um, I went to a, a cattle client's place. He just had calves dying everywhere. Um, and they were kind of in a dry lot situation and I didn't see any water troughs anywhere. He had automatic waters, but they were pretty high off the ground. Um, I said, where's your water troughs? He said, I got automatic waters and the calves couldn't reach them. And so, Although they're drinking milk from mama, uh, they still need a tremendous amount of water. And I always, I think it's, uh, if you look at dry matter intake, it's usually a one-to-one -one ratio, maybe even a little more depending on the type of year, but uh, water can't be overemphasized. And I think that uh, a tremendous amount of sickness and herd health can be uh, addressed with just uh, getting our animals to drink more water, however that may be. And so these are, um, little ones for fawns that you can put underneath the feed trough. Uh, those fawns can get down in there. They don't have to go over uh, the wall of a trough. They can just dip down and get that. These are nice because um, they have a float valve that doesn't matter how level it is, it's gonna adjust to itself. And so uh, just thinking about water quality uh, is something that I don't think we can overemphasize. Oh, cool. Sir. Yeah, I noticed that I had a black cozy in here after. Um, that's in a colder place. I say black cozy, that's really a Texas thing. Because um, if you got automatic waters in South Texas with a black cozy, uh, the temperature of that water is gonna be, is gonna be hot. Um, this one is up a little bit. For, we don't have that problem in everywhere, but um, yeah, I, I saw that whenever I was going back through here. So uh, I should have put an asterisk and say South Texas, but uh, temperature is a big deal, and those fawns aren't, no deer is going to go if the water's too hot. They will if they have to, but they're not going to want to. Well, I got black I'm 
Um, there's a hose that I really like called uh, Flexzilla. It's like a, a yellow, like a light yellow green color. Um, and so uh, that's just the one that I use at home because it doesn't kink. But um, as far as honestly, it's a, you just go to Home Depot and whatever, the lightest color hose that you can find um, is what I would get because it's gonna, you can affect the water temperature quite a bit uh, just with the color of your hose. Um, we'll talk, we'll get into this a little bit and then we can take a break. Um, I, a lot of these slides are pictures so I don't plan on keeping us here until three o'clock. Um, we'll take a break, at take some breaks. I should be done close to lunch. Um, if y'all want me to come back or y'all got questions, I can be back here after lunch, but uh, I wanna respect y'all's time too, so uh, we'll. Um, okay, we're gonna talk about gut health for a little bit, uh, particularly in those babies and then setting them up for success. And so health starts in the gut. Um, I got some stuff in here to show you that's true in humans. It's definitely true in animals. And so I don't think we can overemphasize the importance of, of gut health. And when we talk about a baby that's being born, two critical events have to happen for that baby to be set up for success. We have to inoculate the gut, because when that baby's born, um, it's a sterile environment. And then we have to have the timely absorption of colostrum. And so <clears throat> moving forward with both of those, the first one that we'll talk about is the inoculation of the gut. And so something that's really, really neat that happens when a baby is born, uh, regardless of what type of species or animal, uh, when it comes through the birth canal, uh, it swallows fluids. That's not sterile, uh, depending on where it is in the repro tract. And that's the first start to inoculating the gut with good bacteria. Uh, we have this ongoing battle of good versus bad bacteria, but in that case, it's good bacteria. Um, they're gonna get some bacteria from nursing on mama. Hopefully she's in a good clean condition. Uh, and so we're not introducing a, a burden of bad bacteria. And then uh, we also need to pay attention to what, how we're feeding bottle babies because uh, we have an avenue of potentially harmful bacteria that we could introduce there. So from the gut, from that health, uh, they're able to prove now um, that it sets that animal up for immune function, good health, uh, absorption of nutrients, and, um, and it, uh, the gut and the immune system have a lot more correlation and association now than we had thought. Uh, Doc just showed me this. This is an article that came out of Canada um, talking about COVID. And it says that, uh, I don't know if you can read it, but poor gut health is associated with leaky gut, a term that refers to unhealthy gut lining that has cracks that allow bacteria, toxins, and partially digested food to leak through the gut lining into the bloodstream. All right, this is a human article that came out two weeks ago. And then it says here that a fiber deficient diet is one main cause of altered gut microbiomes and such gut microbiomes leads to chronic diseases. So they're saying right here in people that an altered gut health uh, has a potential cause of chronic disease in humans. And then sim down at the very bottom, simply increasing the daily intake of dietary fiber may markedly improve gut health. And so that's what, um, same thing with these animals that we're talking about, which is why I was talking about hay earlier and how important it is um, to take care of these animals when we're feeding them. And Dr. Stan always says a healthy rumen is a healthy deer. And so we wanna make sure that we're taking care of the stomach or the rumen in these animals. Um, so like I said, we need to mimic nature, let that fawn be born. Um, let it suckle, inoculate the gut. When it comes to the management of the microbiome, on our part, um, good pin management, um, making sure that we have ideally be able to rest our pins or rotate our pins um, so that those, those aren't just living in filth um, and that that's what those babies are being born into. Density issues for over densely, over densely populated pens. We all know that that just leads to poor pen conditions because there's too many animals in there. Drug use, um, darts and antibiotics are good, but they're not benign. Uh, so they have a purpose, but they can also, um, anytime you introduce an antibiotic to an animal, you have the potential of disrupting 
uh, the gut flora. It's going to kill bacteria, whether it's good and bad, and then you can, you can burn the gut up, for lack of a better term, depending on how aggressive you are or if we're over-medicating. Um, and then we have host-adapted organisms, meaning that the, animal, the bugs that live in a fawn's gut are different than when that fawn's a mature doe, and the, gut, the bugs that live in that doe's gut are different than what lives in our gut because um, it's based off of what we eat, how our digestive system works, how we're taken care of, um, and so a lot they can go into that. And then enhancing rumen development from those animals. Moving into colostrum, we said that timely absorption of colostrum has to take place. <clears throat> Fawns don't get any immunity from the mom, or if they do, it's very little, unlike humans. Um, so that colostrum is their immunity. And so we need to figure out a way to maximize that. So what is colostrum? Uh, it's that first milk. It's rich in fat. It's rich in proteins. It's got vitamins and minerals in it. And the most important thing that she's giving that baby at that time in the colostrum um, are white blood cells and antibodies. And so I pulled this straight from cancer website. Um, ask a definition of an antibody. So it's a protein that basically recognizes a foreign disease agent. Uh, we call them antigens because they are antibody generating. And so that's what, when something comes into the body that's not supposed to be there, that antibody recognizes it, attaches to it, signals for help, and that's how the body can either neutralize or eliminate uh, pathogens. And so the baby isn't, fawns aren't born with any of that, and they get it from the colostrum. No, she's. Are they split one? Uh, it's that colostrum is produced by the doe for probably the first few days of life. Um, as far as the immune function and the absorption of antibodies, that can only happen through the gut of the fawn for the first 12, 24 hours at the max. So, um, that, those first 12 to 24 hours, she has plenty to supply twins. Um, it is something that we need to think about, which is why feeding is important, because we want to make sure that we've taken care of her enough nutritionally to support those. But that colostrum, because it's so rich in protein and fat, is available for the first couple of days of life. Um, but as far as the immune function, that's only relevant to the fawn for those. But she'll have enough to take care of, hopefully, however many she has. Not. If we overstimulate her and she's got six babies, probably not. But twins, um, she should have plenty to take care of both of those. And so um, antibodies, that's what's in colostrum that we really care about when it comes to immune function. Um, if that doesn't happen or if they're missing those antibodies, that's when we see trouble down the road. And so. Can I ask one thing? Something to watch, too, is you know, we, got, we all have these doses that will nurse anything that comes along. Right. You know, and, and you can talk late born fawns, early born fawns aren't so bad. They're all kind of having them. But you start getting those late born fawns where you have fawns that are already a month old or whatever that are really aggressive, you know, they're your, some of them are just watching for something to happen. And that's probably when you, know, you have issues with the fawn down the road, it's probably a deal where they didn't get the fawn from because one of those more aggressive fawns come along and the nurse and all that newborn was sitting there wobbly legged and not knowing what to do. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of reasons that we have problems with late fawns, but milk stealing's probably what starts all of that. Um, they're just it just it happens. Um, and so I have this picture up here, uh, a mirror image of this eagle over the water because the colostrum that that mama is passing down to her babies is a, is a reflection of what's circulating in her blood uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's a really cool picture of how God designed all of this because um, you have the this is a graph showing the antibody level, um, and it, this happens to be a sheep, but it's the same for, for does, um, or it would look the same. So you have this circulating level of antibodies in this mama. And then this is 15 days to a month before she has her, her fawns. And then you see this drastic decrease in her antibody level in her circulating bloodstream. And you're saying, well, where is it going? And she says, well, she's putting it, she's giving everything she has to that baby. So this immune, the antibody level from her serum uh, drops down because she's harnessing all of that into her colostrum so that she can pass that on to her baby. So a really cool picture of, of what moms do for their babies. And, and in this case, she's literally giving um, everything she has to this baby as you can graph it out uh, on an antibody chart. So 
we call colostrum the first milk, as I alluded to, um, the ability of that fawn to absorb colostrum is a very small time window. And so it only happens the first day of life, and I would argue that it really only happens the first half of that first day of life. And so that's why those first couple hours are so critical in making sure that that fawn uh, can get up and nurse the mama, nurse its mama, um, so that it can get the colostrum and absorb it. And so when a newborn ruminant nurses, uh, its rumen doesn't work yet, so it goes straight to the, the true stomach, and then from there it goes through the small intestines, but it's those antibodies, those white blood cells, um, are actually able to be absorbed through the gut wall um, into systemic circulation and become a part of that animal's immune system. And it doesn't happen any other time of that animal's life other than that. Um, the problem with that process is it's non-selective. So we would hope that they're getting everything good, but if there's bacteria, uh, certainly bad bacteria present, and what that fawn's digesting those first couple hours of life, those will also enter into systemic circulation. So this is a paper that just illustrates that um, the amount of immunity or antibodies that these animals nursed on the first day was decreased by half depending on the bacteria burden that was also introduced to them. And so I know that we talked about bacteria earlier um, and this ongoing play of good bacteria versus bad bacteria, but this one was E. coli and this one. Um, and so if we're not careful in the environment that those fawns are born or how we're preparing our formulas for bottle feeding, uh, we can do a lot of damage to these animals. Uh, so back to the question, how do we increase quantity and how do we increase quality? Uh, quality is the first thing that I look at is, is age related. And so if you look at a, a maiden doe, versus a two-year-old versus a mature doe. That maiden doe hasn't lived on the property very long. She hasn't lived through as many disease exposures, and her immune system certainly isn't as robust as a 10-year-old doe that's on the same place. And so if we, can, if we look at this and rank them, that first-time mama's colostrum is a lot inferior quality just as far as what she can pass on than the 10-year-old does. And so I think that... Um, if you were able to sit back and look at your health records, you would see a higher percentage of sickness in your fawns from your new mamas than fawns from your older does on your place. And, and a lot of that starts not just experience, but with the quality of the colostrum based on the immune system of those does that the fawns are born to. So this is a, this is just a graph showing quantity and quality. Um, Quality, like I said, is age-related and nutrition-related. Um, quantity, again, it was probably nutrition. If a doe doesn't have enough to eat, then she's going to have a hard time passing on more to her baby. Um, but I think as far as management of colostrum goes um, and things that we can pay attention to, obviously, <clears throat> if all of that immunity on that graph that I showed you is happening 15 days before birth, um, if a doe has preemies two weeks early, that's short-circuited that cycle. And so that's another thing that we look at as far as quality of colostrum being lower in premature babies. Um, induction of labor is not a, something that we see a lot of in the whitetail industry. It's, it does happen in other livestock industries, but again, if we're cutting that pregnancy short, um, we risk jeopardizing the quality of the colostrum number of lactation that goes with age of the animal. So the more times that that doe has had babies, the older she is, the higher quality her colostrum is gonna be in general. Litter size, like uh, you alluded to, sir, uh, bigger litters, uh, there is a threshold reached on what that mama can support. Um, and then stress, if we're stressing those animals, stress releases cortisol. Cortisol uh, inhibits immune function or, or hurts it. And so if we have stressful events in the lives of those does right before fawning, um, that can affect quality as well. Bovatec, I mentioned it earlier uh, as far as the loose mineral goes. Um, it's a coccidiostat. It's a powder. You can mix it in your feed. You can mix it in your mineral. Um, but it's shown to change the fatty acid profile and increase milk production. So if we can increase milk production, 
uh, there's a chance that we can increase the quality, the quantity of colostrum as well. And then um, worst case scenario, if something happens to a doe in labor that was otherwise healthy, if she, I mean, if you had a traumatic birth experience, it's challenging, but you can milk, strip that doe out and collect some of that colostrum and freeze it. And then if you have a baby later that, uh, an orphan fawn or something else, uh, you can thaw that colostrum and you can give it to another baby. So hopefully that doesn't happen, but if it does, um, there's something that you can do to, to still utilize that doe even though sh she passed away. This is a chart just showing the different milk of the different species. Um, just kind of interesting when you look at uh, dry matter, you could call that thickness or density. Um, how dense deer milk is compared to cows or sheep or humans. And then you have the whale. Uh, crude protein, you can see how much more protein is in uh, doe milk than these other species. Um, and then fat, if you look at whale milk, whale milk is like, a, I just think it's kind of amazing. I really just talked about this so I could show you this picture. This is a picture of a whale nursing her calf. So they actually eject milk into the water and it has such a high fat content that it's like pudding. Um, and then that, that whale calf uh, swims up and, and drinks the water and milk together. But uh, yeah, that's how whales nurse um, is by ejecting it into the water and then the calf uh, drinks the water. Um, but just showing you how different, I know that we use red cat milk, we use goat milk, we use sheep milk, we use anything. Um, but really, uh, by design, it's all different. I don't, I'm not saying that milk replacers are wrong, uh, but we just have to understand that it's not natural, and so there's consequences that, that could come from that. So it's been an hour. I think this is a good place to take a break for a little bit. So let's take a 10 to 15 minute break, and then we'll come back and, and keep rolling. OK, we're going to talk into a move into failure passive transfer. So um, and what causes that, how we can fix it, and what are the consequences consequences of it. So uh, I'm going to, this is a, some of these are new slides I made, but uh, I want to try to explain the difference between active and passive immunity. So active immunity is what we're hoping happens whenever you get the new COVID vaccine um, or any vaccine, uh, or if you get sick and live through it. So what happens is our body recognizes a disease organism. We call that an antigen, uh, again, because they're antibody generators. So an antigen triggers the immune system. That's either from an infection or exposure or in a controlled environment. That's what a vaccine is. So we give, we show a, a disease to the body. And we're hoping that that body recognizes that disease, says, hey, this isn't supposed to be here. Let's figure out a way to take care of it. In that process, antibodies are formed um, that start a signal cascade that, says, that finds the bad guy, shows it to the boss, the immune system, and then the immune system gets rid of it. And so that's what we call active because it's adaptive. Um, it, the body sees something and it takes care of it. And then the next time that the body sees that same disease, if the immune system is working appropriately, the response is faster and stronger the second time. We call that memory. Um, and this type of immunity is long lasting and that's what comes with age and experience. That's why those old does have a higher quality colostrum than those young ones because um, of active immunity through the years, building up memory cells uh, in their immune system. On the other hand, we have passive immunity and that's what happens when these fawns are nursing colostrum. The mom is literally passing immune function onto those babies. So it's not something that they make or uh, develop, but it's something that they're passed or given to. And so we give antibodies straight to these animals through the colostrum, and then those antibodies are able to recognize diseases, show it to that fawn's immune system, and then that fawn can uh, uh, take care of that disease, hopefully. Um, and then if you think about step two from there, active immunity starts to take place. Um,
I would say, I would say the qual. I think that goes back to, um, I'm gonna say yes in a roundabout way because if you have genetic lines of deer that are known for being hardy, known for livability, um, obviously they have a robust immune system, and so when they have fawns, they're gonna be able to pass that on through the colostrum initially, um, and some genetic component uh, to those babies. So I would say yes. No. <laughs> Not in humans. That's how it works. Uh, we would, because our moms gave us direct immunity while we were growing inside of her. In in ruminant animals, all of that happens through the colostrum. I, there's a, I mean, there's a lot of genetic factors that play into it in general. Um, but as far as the bulk of the immune system, you can't have a superior. If you have a a bulletproof doe, I mean, she's just like, you cannot kill her. And if she has a baby and, that, and you take that baby away so that that baby can't get colostrum, the genetics, the DNA of that animal is not strong enough that that animal would survive without colostrum. So the colostrum has to be there. Now, if you had a, that bulletproof doe, the combined effect of the DNA of that baby and that mom's colostrum because of how good her immune system is, is gonna be better than if you have a doe that's four years old and has needed a shot of Draxin every day of its life to live, if that makes any sense. But without the colostrum, it doesn't matter how good the genetics are. Can the buck pass on immunity? The buck, that goes back to selecting for livability. Um, there is a genetic component that gets the, when those babies are on the ground, you know, half of its livability instincts or DNA is gonna come from the mom and the dad. So um, I would say yes again. Again, it, it all depends on making sure that baby gets colostrum, but the genetics from the buck and the doe are gonna give it a good start. Not through the semen. It's uh, it's all done on a DNA level, and um, so. You know, They're getting DNA from the semen. Yeah, I'm. I, yeah, it's not the yes. So it, it's. So we can. Through the. Yeah, I would. I don't know if I. Would, there's a influence. I don't know how to put. I don't know how to put it into, uh, into fancy explanatory words, but if I had, if I had a doe um, and one year I bred her to a buck that um, wasn't a, I believe that there are certain genetic lines that don't do as well in the face of VHD as others. So if I bred her to a buck that I'd seen a lot of offspring from him die from true EHD, and then the next year, if I bred that same doe to a buck that I that was 15 years old, and I'd known that his it looks like his offspring live, I would expect the buck, the babies from him to do better than. The, does that make sense? I don't know how to. The answer is yes. I don't know how to put it in eloquent scientific terms, but um, I tell people all the time that I think you need to select for livability, which is I think the same thing that you're asking for. Um, and the problem is, in the whitetail industry, right, wrong, or indifferent, we breed, the industry tends to breed animals really young because we're trying to push antler production. Um, and if you can decrease your genetic interval by breeding younger animals, um, but at the same time, if we breed a two-year-old because he's 300 inches, but then he dies at three um, from a sickness, and then you have another buck that was 12 years old and still breeding 20 does in the pen. Uh, you know, 
I don't think we'd select for livability as an industry um, as much as we could. Um, so, but then I have other guys that, you know, they don't, they won't breed a deer until they see what it looks like at six. And so, and then they, the answer is yes. Uh, I just don't know how to put it in super eloquent words. Yeah, DNA and genetics mean nothing if that baby doesn't get colostrum. So you can, yeah, that, um, and I'll try, to, I'll try to hammer that in as we go, but none of that means anything if that baby doesn't get colostrum um, or antibodies the first 12 hours of life. Um, it's better than nothing, and so uh, they're they're not bad. I wouldn't put a lot of weight on them as far as I wouldn't incorporate them over just letting that baby nurse naturally. Um, but if you're in a bind um, and you have artificial colostrum, now you have to be really careful because there's there's tubes of paste and there's powders that are called supplements, like colostrum supplements and then there's colostrum replacers. And if you look on the bag, it should give you an IgG level, and we'll talk about IgG in a little bit, but that's an, that's a, an antibody. They should, a true colostrum replacer should give you an antibody level on the back of it. Um, a lot of the colostrum supplements are just fat and protein that they're wanting to give babies that first day of life. I actually think those are harmful um, if they don't have any antibodies in them because of that, the way that it's all absorbed. But um, I don't think anything's better than what the mom gives, but if you're in a bind, then the artificial ones uh, are gonna get you likely where you need if something happened. On a, like a colostrum replacer, if you pull them off after 24 hours, does that mean that they're gonna be in Um, if you pulled it from the mom and you know that it nursed the first 24 hours, then technically it shouldn't need a colostrum replacer after that. If you found it at 24 hours old and you know that it didn't nurse, if the mom died or if the fawn's sick and wet and has obviously hasn't nursed, then you're too late and you'd have to do like a a blood tra a plasma transfusion because the the gut at that point in time has closed and the avenue for colostrum to be absorbed into the immune system isn't available anymore and so uh, if it's 24 hours at that fawn's 24 hours old and it's lucky enough to still be alive but it hasn't nursed then you have to go to plan b and you'd have to do like a plasma transfusion in order for that fawn to get the antibodies that it needs to live so, um, so yeah, passive immunity, that's what the moms, that's what we call the process of acquiring immunity through the colostrum, which is an avenue that ruminants have to take because antibodies can't pass through the placenta like they can in humans. And if that doesn't happen, then we call that failure of passive transfer. And so we talked about this uh, Sean alluded to it earlier, uh, fawn stealing. Um, you know, if you have older fawns come and nurse from a doe that fawned late in August or September, or um, if a doe comes and takes that baby, like we talked about, she has already been nursing for a month or so. She doesn't have colostrum. That fawn stands up and nurses from her. He's got a full belly. He feels good for a little bit, but he didn't get any immunity from her. So premature fawns, we talked about how that impacts colostrum quality. Um, some does, uh, you know, when we're doing AI for people, if a doe has a bad bag, uh, we tell the owner because then they're gonna likely need to pull that fawn and give it an artificial colostrum um, or a, a antibody blood product if they have it um, because that doe may not be able to make adequate uh, colostrum based on her udder. Um, Hot fawns, cold fawns, lost fawns, um, or just improper bonding. 
between those. So anything that you can imagine though to interrupt those first 12 to 24 hours of nursing is going to create an issue that could lead to failure passive transfer. So um, I don't know how comfortable people are drawing blood, but the, if you have a question about failure passive transfer, there, there is a relatively simple way to measure this. Um, this is called a refractometer. It's used to measure the amount of solids in a liquid. And so they're not that expensive. Uh, they're about $200, I think. And <clears throat> what you can do is you or if you have a vet come out, they can draw blood from a fawn and let it clot. And you take the serum and you put a drop of serum on this slide and you look at it through the light. And this is the type of reading that you'll see. And somebody way smarter than me figured out these calibrations and they know that um, if you have a reading of about eight or lower on that refractometer, so in this case it would look, if that blue line was at the eight, around the eight, then you would know that that fawn has failure of passive transfer. Eight, because of the calculations of measuring the proteins in the liquid, in the serum, eight is the cutoff for this particular instrument. There's different instruments, but this is the most common one. Um, they have digital ones, but basically what it's doing is it's measuring the amount of proteins in the serum, and they were able, we know that five grams of protein per deciliter of serum, which really small amount, but they know that that's the, that's the threshold for antibody level for failure passive transfer. Um, and it sounds really complicated, but in short and simple terms, if you take a drop of serum from one of these babies and you put it on this machine and it's less than eight, then that baby got failure passive transfer and we need to do something to help it. Um, and again, if you can take, you just need a cc of blood. It, it's not much. That's hard to get on a fawn. Um, but if you have somebody that can get it, this is something that you can do in your fawn nursery to assess whether or not um, this fawn got adequate colostrum. So it's a lot more common than we think. This was a study in, on lambs, um, but if you look here, they took all of the death loss between one day old and five weeks, which I think that a lot of your fawn mortality would fit into that window. So anything basically between birth and five weeks old that died, 50% of those lambs had failure of passive transfer when they tested the protein in the serum. And so that's a pretty big deal. Imagine if we could potentially address uh, fifth, almost 50% of the loss between uh, birth and five weeks old. The systems that we're gonna see affected first when it comes to this are our GI system and our lungs, um, and then you'll see some secondary systems that are affected as well. <clears throat> so we talked about this, but it's a fact that does are routinely stealing fawns from others, which can impair the failure passive transfer process. Um, it's also a fact that fawns are born in poor conditions. Those high bacteria loads can interfere with the absorption of colostrum, um, leading to some problems with immunity. And it's also a fact that these fawns don't have a competent immune system and they need help. And if they don't get help, they're doomed for poor success. So our goal, like any production system, should be uniform balance. Um, and the higher that we can get that amount of antibody level, the lower chance we have a failure passive transfer. So I go back to this serum and colostrum. Uh, one way that we've helped clients do this, other practitioners as well, um, is to say, hey, we can't give more colostrum, but if we have some serum on hand to be able to give these babies, um, we can use that. You can use an artificial colostrum replacer, but this started because we had clients, Dr. Stan and Dr. Greg had clients, deer dying from EHD. They were able to identify those animals that have lived through EHD, collect serum off of them, and then give those EHD antibodies to sick animals on the property uh, in the face of an outbreak or even potentially as a preventative um, if an outbreak was coming. And, so, and then it's kind of morphed into people wanting to give it to their fawns to combat some of these failure passive transfer issues or boost overall immune system. So when I talk about autogenous serum or antibody rich serum, 
I try to explain it to people um, as if it was another production trait that we're measuring. So we think about antlers. You have an elite buck that you want to um, spread genetics to in your herd. You take his semen, we AI a bunch of does. We're trying to push a uniform fawn crop um, with his antler production. In the same way with the serum, we identify animals that have elite immunity, either because they've lived through a particular outbreak that's detrimental, detrimental to our herd, um, or it's an old JB doe that's 15 years old and has just lived through everything. Uh, you can take their serum and give it to fawns um, or other animals as an immune booster, potentially replacer, depending on when you give it. So um, I wrote an article for the Fall Magazine because uh, President Trump and a lot of other people got antibody-rich plasma after being diagnosed with COVID. So it's the same, it's the same philosophy. People, and if you've had COVID, you can go give blood and that's what they're gonna do with your blood. They'll collect the plasma and the antibodies from it and then give it to people that are currently infected with COVID um, as a way to combat the disease. When there was a doctor, was it Samaritan's Purse for Ebola? Yeah. A doctor was in Africa with uh, the Ebola outbreak, contracted Ebola, came back to the States. They flew another doctor to his bedside that had lived through Ebola, took his blood, and gave it to the man that had it uh, as a way to combat it. So, um, and it's happened. When do you think the first this was first done? D decades ago, centuries, long time ago. Long time ago. So it's, it's not a new technique. Um, it's kind of an old an old pony that is kind of being brought back. But um, the thought process is you're taking elite immunity for something and giving it to something that needs a little bit of help. Um, difference between serum and plasma, they're both the liquid part of blood. Um, the difference is serum, we let the blood clot, so it doesn't have those platelets or the clotting factors. Serum, or I'm sorry, plasma still has those clotting factors and platelets, it just doesn't have the red blood cells or white blood cells. And so, so they're both the liquid part of blood, meaning they don't have the red blood cells or the white blood cells. It's just the liquid. Plasma still has the clotting factors because when we, when you make plasma, you collect blood and you put an anticoagulant in there, meaning that the blood never clots. You spin the blood which, so that you can collect all the red blood cells and separate it from the liquid. On serum, you just collect it and you let the blood clot itself and then you separate the liquid off of it. And so the only difference really between plasma and serum is plasma still has clotting factors and platelets in it. That's why if you have, um, if, if uh, an animal has like an immune mediated disease where the body is destroying platelets or clotting factors, there's a, or hemophilia, like those types of disease, they'll give plasma because it still has, it has the clotting factors in it which can help those people. Um, as far as, Using it as a, as a treatment, uh, I think serum is a little bit more effective. I mean, and we're splitting hairs here. They're both gonna do the same thing. Um, but because of the process of absorption of antibodies in the gut is selective, I don't wanna give that animal any other thing but antibodies. So we use serum because the platelets and clotting factors can interfere. But again, that's splitting hairs. Um, if you look at human medicine, they're using platelets, they're using plasma. Um, there's added benefits for the diseases that they're usually treating, that they can benefit from that. But um, again, they're very similar products. They look the same when they're, when they're harvested, but <clears throat> the overall goal is there's antibodies in both of those that we're trying to pass on to an animal that needs them. Um, so. These are just some things that are in serum. Again, everything that was in colostrum, because colostrum's made from what that dough's putting in the serum. This is a really cool paper. Um, it's standard because of, I don't know if you've ever heard of Yoni's disease in calves, uh, or in dairy calves, but it's, it is industry standard that the, the instant that 
a dairy calf is born, they pull that calf off the mom and they give it artificial colostrum because one of the ways that yonis uh, is passed on to calves is through the colostrum. So I don't know if there's a single dairy calf in the country that actually gets to nurse its mom. They pull it when it's born and they give it artificial colostrum to try to combat yonis disease. And so um, because of that, there's a tremendous amount of research done into passive transfer of immunity and dairy calves because everything is given colostrum replacer. So this is a really cool study where they gave calves colostrum replacer, they gave some serum, and then they gave some natural colostrum from the mom. Um, and when they measured the blood protein level, like, a, like we talked about, the most efficient absorption of antibodies was from oral serum. And so that just fits with some of the techniques that we're doing to help people as far as offering oral serum to, to day old fawns um, that might need it. And this is just a, pro a paper proving that it's not crazy, that, it, that it's scientifically founded and what it's doing. So this was a cool paper. All three groups um, had the same mortality, uh, but the calves that had serum had dramatically lower treatment rates, meaning they didn't get sick as often as the other calves. Um, so, and then the, it did have a more efficient absorption. So people say, why do they need serum and colostrum if you're gonna try to help something? Well, serum doesn't have cells in it. There's still white blood cells um, that are passed on through the colostrum. But <clears throat> imagine if you have a, imagine if you bought a doe at an auction tonight, a bred yearling. She comes to your place in March. She's gonna have some expensive babies because you just bought a, a grand auction lot. That doe that comes to your place in March is gonna been at your place for approximately two months before she fawns meaning she hasn't had a chance to really develop any type of immunity to the pathogens and diseases that are specific to your farm. So you can have serum ready from a 10-year-old doe that's lived in her place her whole life. She's seen everything there. You can then take that serum and supplement those babies to give them an extra boost, if that makes sense. And so it, it just goes back to the overall picture of understanding and knowing different types of quality of colostrum history on the animals, but um, this is something that clients have been doing really with animals that they're moving into their place um, or animals born from young moms. And so this is a complicated graph, but I just want to focus on this picture right here. So the black line is, uh, is our fawn's passive immunity. And so you can see on the left at the top, if that if we have failure passive transfer, then that black line doesn't even exist. And that's when we need to give it serum or uh, artificial colostrum replacer um, so that we have some immunity. And then about this time of weaning, you can see that this passive transfer is starting to decline and the active immunity that we talked about where an animal sees a disease, is able to recognize it and respond, really hasn't taken off yet. And so another way that people can use serum um, or other blood products or antibody products is to give it at weaning to try to level this playing field. So this is a um, similar type graph, but you can see this threshold that happens as that fawn gets older. And with an antibody product, regardless of the source, you can level that playing field and try to help those fawns during that time um, of sickness. Because if, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think if you graft all of your fawn mortality, you're gonna have a peak between zero and seven days of life. You're gonna have a peak around 45 days, give or take, and then you're gonna have a peak at weaning. That, those seem to be the three most popular times that people lose fawns. And so our job with our clients is try to create ways that we can address those different issues. Chris. So are you saying that, that serum can replace colostrum? No, I would not. Oh. They don't need, I don't think every animal needs both. I think that there's and certain fawns that, yeah, if, um, I mean, it can replace it. Like if you're in a, if something, if something happened where it didn't get any and you're still in that window, um, it can, it has the potential to replace it. I wouldn't, folk, I wouldn't hope that that happened. Um, but yeah, our, I would suggest that they get both if depending on 
what that font is telling you. If it's from a young mom, if, that, if something happened and you don't think that it got enough colostrum, if there are quads, so. It has to hit that window, um, and you can give it in the muscle afterwards. Uh, you're gonna still get, probably, I would comfortably say three weeks of protection at least, um, but ideally, if that, fawn's, if that fawn was gonna need it uh, because of a, a poor event the first day of life, it would need it in that window. Um, but we talk to our clients, and if, if uh, if a particular farm has really, really good livability between birth and weaning, um, but then the wagons fall off the wheel after weaning, then I, Doc and I suggest don't use it the day of age, use it at weaning in the muscle. Because, and I'm trying to get my cattle clients to do this too, because at weaning, the standard right now in the cattle industry is to give an antibiotic at weaning to help them through that period of stress but there's such a high premium on antibiotic free or all natural beef now that um, guys are starting to back away from that and then you have some sickness and death after weaning. But at weaning in the muscle, you're still gonna get antibody absorption um, and it's gonna get them through that period where their immune system's dipping and, and they haven't really developed their own yet. So my guess is on your specific farm after weaning most of your sickness and death loss is going to come within 14 days of weaning maybe 21 days so you give antibodies at the time of weaning in the muscle and that's going to give you that coverage for that two to three week window of susceptibility so um you got another one chris i'll come back to you sir sure Yes. And, and you give a high dose, you know, recommend a high dose. And we've always used that on the weaning time that we're struggling, and that worked really well for us. Yeah, I think you can, I mean, well, I think it did. It, I think it's like, like the mineral question earlier, like, I don't know that it, anything, Antibody derived is better than nothing, um, and if those if those cattle products are working, that's great. The difference between that and something that someone makes for you at your own farm, or like I, I know that there's I know that there's farms here that make it themselves. Um, the the biggest difference between those manufactured products and farm specific products is it's it's what's specific to your herd. But if something's working, I'm not going to ask you to change it. Um, and if and so, but that's uh, and I, I can't mass produce legally. I can come to your farm and I can make something or any veterinarian legally come to you and leave it. But to make a biologic product from one farm and sell it to somebody else requires millions and millions of dollars of licensing fees from FDA. And so there's people that have paid those monies and been able to do that. Um, but most of those products are monoclonal, meaning they're just specific to one disease. Um, a farm-specific product is like the auto is, I mean, it's, it's for what your farm is, so. But if, if something's working, I think Colorado Serum Company or whatever they're called makes a bunch of different antibodies. If something's working, I'm not gonna ask, that's great. Yeah, that's what, yes. And so when it first started, that's what people were doing during EHT. Um, I think people have started using it now. We've changed the way that we do it. it uh, so they're doing a more broad spectrum, either at, in bigger doses or bigger at numbers of animals. But yeah, you can, you can definitely do it in a dart. It would be a, a big dart, like a 10 cc dart. Um, so, uh, but yeah, it's a, and which is, it's a big dart. It's that's a sizable dart, yeah. Yeah, that's what I dart my, that's what I dart my sick calves with. And they're, you know, they're this long. So, but it's 10 cc's of Draxin to treat a cow if she's got foot rot. So, um, but yeah, this is, again, just, and if this isn't something that you're struggling with on your farm, but if, if it is, there's ways that people, and there's other products, other providers, but just something to think about. 
Let me get the guy. Let me get the guy behind you real quick, because he. Hey, uh, so I'm just curious. So you're recommending them doing the uh, uh, check-in at the antibody level with one CC blood every time they report. No, if I would. So when would you? When would you really want to be looking at blood? Only if I came out and I saw a fawn that. If I came out in the morning and I saw a fresh fawn and I said, I'm going to let that fawn and its mama bond, I'm not going to tag it till this evening. If I came out that evening and that fawn was in the exact same spot, it had a, you know, it was, had a matted hair coat because mama hadn't cleaned it and I could just tell that it hadn't done it, then that's a fawn that I worry about and that's when I would, you probably don't even need to check it because you, it should we should probably know for the fact that it's in the same spot that it didn't nurse and that we need to do something quick. Um, but it's only fawns that I have like, I'm, that I think something didn't happen that I would check it. But yeah, realistically to check the, to bleed every fawn, um, if there's a, if somebody pulls a fawn and they're gonna take it to the nursery and they thought that it was acting sick or not acting right, then you can check it a couple of days later and you could intervene if you needed to. Um, so, but yeah, it, really it's, most people I think check pins in the morning and the evenings, and if you come back 12 hours later and the fawn hasn't moved, that's one that I would consider evaluating. Do you have another one? Well, yeah, so you mentioned like the death window, right, zero to seven days, 45 days. You know, is there like a cutoff date where you wouldn't want to inject one with like serum? You know, like, so right now, you know, six, seven, eight months old. It's, a cookie cutter answer is, in general, if an animal makes it through weaning, like, you usually don't have problems with them once they've once they've lived through that and they're in. Once they're old enough to start entering into the breeder pens, like, in general, they might hit a fence and you might have a disaster of. Eat, something may sweep, but in general, I don't think we see a lot of problems in those. But that goes back to not everything's cookie cutter. So it, if if you have that specific problem and you're seeing something, um, like I went, we went to a farm the other day to collect semen, and they'd lost four bucks in a pen the week that before we got there. And so like that's when you go back and have a conversation and say, what do we think is going on? Um, and nothing is just. I mean, we can't just call everything EHD. You know, we got to be able to say, did you cut those deer open? Did you send off samples to the lab? What do we really think is going on here? Before we just say, oh, that was EHD. We could fix it with serum. Because it could have been something as, I mean, it could have been something as big as their, a coyote could have been out there running deer in the pens, and they didn't know it, and it stressed a bunch of them one night, and then they died. So um, the, I don't think that once an animal makes it to the fall of its first year of life, we usually don't have a, a huge problem with them in general. Um, but if, so I would say after weaning, they probably don't need it. <clears throat> so. well, how are they being deer with THD with serum? You mentioned that a couple of times. Are they taking serum from a deer that survived THD and then immunizing like a month before meat consistency starts? It originally started with, um, can I tell a story about Poland? Sure. So Dr. Stan was born and raised in Poland, uh, grew up, went to vet school there, was working in the dairies. Um, they had a massive outbreak of salmonella. Salmonella, right? N nothing touched that disease. No antibiotics, no nothing. Calves were dying at a, at a high rate. He remembered that one of his professors in vet school told him if all else fails, find the oldest animal on the farm, bleed it, take the serum, and give it to the sick animals. So that's what they did. Started bleeding the older cows, giving that serum to the calves, and it, there was an improvement. Um, and so that transitioned over into EHD. This was a different time when the market was through the roof. Um, but yes, they, they would find animals that live through EHD. We can test those animals to check their antibody level, their titers to EHD. They would make serum from those animals. And then if an animal was sick, dart it down. And when they're given it antibiotics and fluids, they would give it a vial of serum as well, which allowed, 
which allowed those antibodies to then ne hopefully neutralize the virus in that animal. Um, if, you had it, if you had it ahead of time and you thought that an outbreak was coming, you lost some valuable deer, then you could potentially start darting it or run a pin through and give them all ahead of time and hope that that protection is gonna get them through. If you know that it's already on your farm, and you know EHD, if, if it's really there, everything could be fine one day and 20% could be dead the next day. But in general, with this type of immune system, I comfortably think that you have th three weeks plus or minus on your protection level. And so it's not gonna get you through, but you have to imagine that if you give it to something ahead of time and it allows that animal to live through that disease, then you have active immunity that picks up. So you allow that animal to get through the disease so that it can next time hopefully recognize it itself and take care of it. And so there's an overlap between passive immunity and active immunity. Um, but if you can get those animals through that first outbreak, um, that they may not have lived through initially, then you're setting them up hopefully for success the next time that it comes. So, um, but we noticed that in our, the demographics of, of our clientele shifted a little bit. We don't do as much northern work anymore. We're more Texas and South Texas. EHD is not as big of a problem there because I think that the disease is so prevalent there year round that the, you just don't see sick. They're not naive animals and so they don't have as much of a problem as an animal that might be from the north where EHD kicks in. And so we've shifted kind of the focus to more fawn health and using it that way. But it's um, it seems to be, the way that they use it in humans is what you alluded to. Something is sick, they give it serum to help combat that disease at that specific time. So it, in humans, it's used as a treatment um, and, and less so as a preventative. Sir? So how many CCs will serve for fawn or Honestly, it's roughly the same because if you think about how we're using it, in a fawn, we're incorporated into its immune system that first day of life. Um, and an adult deer, we're just using it like as a Band-Aid to get through a rough patch. So, um, the way that we started doing it was packaging it in the, the biggest dart volume that we could. So in this case, I do think more is better. We were limited by a 10 cc dart and we found that that was effective and so that's, that's where we started. There's other, and if, <clears throat> if you're making it, I mean if you're giving it orally you could get, but honestly, a fawn stomach isn't that big so if you, I mean, I don't know how much you could stretch the volume if you're giving it orally to a fawn because their stomach's, their stomach's not that big. Sir? So what's the cost to make it roughly and, and how long will it be stored the shelf life is, The shelf life is, I mean, you have a couple years if it stays in the freezer. Um, so you have to think about the serum itself. I don't know how familiar you are with like diagnostic labs, but when you send off a bacteria sample to the diagnostic lab, they put it, they smear it on a plate and they grow that bacteria in an incubator. And really that plate that they're growing the bacteria on is the same thing that's in that, it's a blood product because of how nutritious it is to the bacteria. So um, we process it sterilely and we ask you to put it straight into the freezer because that's the lowest chance of any kind of contamination. And then as far as the pricing goes, it's it's really, it's, a, it's based on the quantities that you order. Um, but, I mean, it, we try to make it as cost efficient as possible so that you can give it to more than just a couple animals. But that's, it's more for, if you're ordering 25 vials, it's a different price than if you're ordering, uh, you know, 150 or 200. So, um, but our goal is to get it to where it's feasible for people to give it to at least all of their AI babies without being it's got to make sense where the savings on an animal's life can pay for the addition of the product. So, um, has anybody ever tried something different, like you know, taking a serum and then lyophilizing it, uh, turning it into like a small tablet? That would be great if you could if you could freeze dry it or lab, that would be incredible. I haven't tried it. Um, I've thought about it because then you would increase the shelf life. Yeah. So. 
Yep. And it wouldn't lose its volume. Yep, no, that would, and then you could actually put more, you could, if you could lyophilize it or freeze dry it, then you can, you can drastically increase the quantity of antibodies without increasing the volume, because you could just mix it stronger. If you did that, how would you? The only thing I'd, uh, I would freeze dry it in vials, and then you just mix it right before you want to use it. The only thing would be, we know that the antibodies survive zero degrees Celsius. I don't know what the. Oh, I guess like 156. Yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't know what the, you just have to understand what kind of, um, what kind of loss you're losing as far as denaturing the proteins through that process. So, but, and there's, like uh, Chris said, there's other companies that do this. Uh, this was really to pitch uh, a process or a science, not, uh, not necessarily our product, because there's other companies that, that do the same thing. Um, Talking about gut health, so when a fawn's born, uh, it only has one functional stomach, just like you and I, a cat, a dog, a horse, and then there has to be a transition period where it moves from one stomach to four functional stomachs. And so <clears throat> it's an intricate process. It's a process that we can either help or hinder. Um, at, when they're babies or they just have one stomach, they take proteins and they break those proteins down into amino acids. They acquire fat and they break those down into fatty acids or they take lactose and transfer it to glucose. And then all of those are absorbed through our small intestines. Um, and so that's how a newborn fawn is getting its nutrients. Different than its mom or its dad that has four functional stomachs. And so <clears throat> these are the four stomachs uh, of a ruminant. So rumen, ruminare in Latin just means chewing again because that's what ruminants do, they're always chewing. The first two compartments are really the same, the rumen and the reticulum. Um, the second compartment is the omasum, which is called the butcher's bible. The abomasum is our true stomach in a ruminant, and then it goes into the small intestine. So in a grown animal that eats hay or feed, all of this comes into the rumen. Um, there's a ton of microbes in there. There's fluid. There's bacteria. It breaks everything down. Um, some of what's broken down is what we call volatile fatty acids. And in a rumen, those VFAs, or volatile fatty acids, go to the liver, and they're reformulated into glucose. And that's how these animals get glucose, is from uh, VFAs in the liver. The bugs in the stomach also break down those protein into a specific form that then goes and is absorbed in the small intestines. Um, the omasum is what we call the butcher's bible, which is, if you look at it uh, on a necropsy, it's got like uh, hundreds of little sheets of intestines that are smushed together like a Bible. And what happens there is all of the feed from the rumen goes into the butcher's Bible. Those pages squeeze, um, it expresses water, and then that's where it starts to form um, more of a compact cut of feed stuff. And then we have our true stomach, which is like our stomach. And then we go to the small intestines where most of our proteins and fatty acids um, are absorbed. And so, Again, um, when we talk about ruminants, we're really feeding the rumen bugs, not necessarily the deer itself. And so, because it doesn't matter what we feed that animal, those rumen bugs are going to break it down and formulate it into a way that that, that, that animal can absorb it. So um, it is still helpful to feed high quality feed because it makes the rumen job that easier. But if you think about, if you think about how big, you know, a beef bull gets from eating grass. Like it's because those rumen bugs are breaking down protein and transfer it into a way that that animal can then absorb. So um, we talk about feeding the deer, but really we're feeding the bugs in the stomach because they're the ones that are breaking everything down into a specific form. Um, and we can either help that process or hurt it. If those animals are sick, the first thing that gets disrupted is the gut flora in the rumen, which is then going to affect digestibility, which is then going to affect nutrition status and health. And so um, <clears throat> as far as our fawns go, we have to help them through this process of transferring from one functional stomach to four. 
And the best way to do that is to introduce feedstuffs earlier. So uh, I wish this wasn't so blurry, but these are, these are the rumens of calves. And so the far left picture is a picture of the lining of a rumen of a calf that was only fed milk until it was weaned. Um, the middle one, and it's, I mean, it's smooth, if you can see it. it there's just no, uh, there's no variation in texture. It's 100% smooth. If you move to the middle picture, um, you can see that there's a little bit more texture to that. That's a calf that was fed milk and hay. And then on the far right, you can see that that's a calf that was filled, filled with mi fed milk, grain, and hay um, before it was weaned. And so the way that the rumen and the digestive system works is the larger the surface area, the more absorption um, can take place. And so you can see that the gut looks a lot healthier on this animal to the right that was fed grain and hay and milk than the animal that was only fed milk. And so um, <clears throat> we have to be able to feed our fawns. And so it's in other livestock industries, most people utilize creep feeding, which is just a system that um, allows if we put feed down on the ground in a deer pen, then the mamas are gonna come eat it and the babies aren't gonna have anything left. Um, and so creep feeding is a way that you can design a corner of the pen, or even if you had a tall feed bunk with these creep panels in, underneath it, but it's a, it's a safe place for fawns to be able to go eat. Um, and they don't have to eat a lot, but they need to be able to nibble on something, especially if there's not grass in their pens, um, because we probably feed in troughs that are too tall for some of those fawns. Um, there's not always hay available. And so if you can imagine uh, the amount of access that fawns really have to feedstuffs or hay, it's probably not as much as it could be if we were to do some management changes. Um, but I think that they do have some feeders now that have creep panels underneath them. And, um, and then, or even just having hay on the ground and, and you can try to feed them on the ground uh, for a limited amount of time before the does eat it up. But it is really important and really beneficial if we can get hay and grain into those babies before they're weaned. And then it's a lot less stressful. You pull them from the mama and they've never really had hay or grain. You put them in a pen by themselves and they don't have their mama's milk and they have a new food that they've never really had before. Um, if, if they're at least used to the food, that's one less stressful process through weaning. And again, um, microbiome so important. Corn can be dangerous. It's got a lot of energy, so it can be really good, but too much of it can cause a lot of problems. We call it acidosis. Um, because of the way that it's digested, but that goes back to that leaky gut term that was mentioned in the coronavirus paper. Um, if you feed too much starch or sugars, you can change the pH of the gut, which disrupts the lining of the gut, which then allows bad bacteria to leak out, or fuso. Um, you know, fuso is in every deer and every, every deer in the world. Um, it's usually contained in the stomach, but if you disrupt the lining of that stomach, you allow fuso to leach out, and then we're gonna, you start to see problems um, in other parts of the body. We're not gonna talk about fawn hydration today unless people want to, or antibiotics, but uh, I did say that we'd talk about anesthesia, so we'll move into that, and then I really don't have a whole lot other than anesthesia, so these are new, and I apologize, but um, I can get them to you or email them. But so I don't have like hard concrete recommendations or things that I just wanted to talk about what we're using and so that people can understand. Uh, there's different classes of knockdown or anesthetic drugs that we use. Um, and so I'm just gonna talk about, similar to how I did in the antibiotic talk, if you've ever heard that one, we'll just talk about the classes, the drugs that are in each of those classes, the effects that they have on the body, um, and then the reversals if they have any. So the first one is opioids. Uh, I mean, in people that's codeine, that's hydromorphone, morphine, fentanyl, and uh, deer, that's butorphanol, or the B in BAM, or MKB. And so it, uh, butorphanol, of all the opioids, is probably one of the least potent, um, which is why we can use it uh, 
scripted out to people in the deer industry, but in conjunction, it's never used by itself, but in conjunction, it's a great option when we mix it with other anesthetics. So opioids itself provide pain relief. We call that analgesia. Um, they provide sedation or immobilization. Uh, we use them in combination with other drugs because uh, opioids have, they cause decrease in respiration, um, and then they can cause a drop in blood pressure too. So if you think about mixing butorphanol with a drug that increases heart rate and blood pressure, you still maintain a nice balance in those and when you're mixing those. So really the only opioid that we use frequently in the deer industry is butorphanol. And if you're using a BAM kit, that's why you're using naloxone or naltrexone as a reversal. So that's, these are the drugs done here that we're using to reverse butorphanol. Benzodiazepines, um, if you were a human a pharmacist or taking, you were probably taking Valium. So that's a, really similar to what we're using in the deer industry. In the deer industry, we're using midazolam, which um, I think there's a product called MKM, which is metatomidine ketamine midazolam, um, or telazole is teletamine and zolazepam. So um, Valium or benzodiazepines are muscle relaxants and they provide strong sedation. And so the way that they use it in the deer industry is to kind of, I call it rounding the curve. Ketamine or teletamine are kind of rougher drugs. Um, they're like psychiatric, psychosychotic drugs. And so we can't reverse ketamine or teletamine. And so a lot of combinations or drug uh, formulations that use a dissociative like ketamine or teletamine will also have a benzodiazepine on board um, to kind of smooth out that recovery process. So if you use midazolam or zolazepam in a formulation, it is gonna be a longer recovery by design because um, deer can be crazy when they wake up off of ketamine. And so they leave a benzodiazepine on board, um, allowing those animals to have, it, it is longer, but a slower, uh, theoretically more controlled recovery. Um, and then if you want to, you can reverse this with flumenzanil. But uh, from my experience, most people don't reverse the benzodiazepine because of why they're using it um, to smooth out the recovery with the dissociative. And again, you have um, in other animals, agitation or vocalization. Uh, I think in, in the ruminants, you can appreciate some ataxia, meaning they're wobbly when they wake up, or, or sedation. But, um, Telazole is designed to be a slower recovery drug, one, because it's a deeper plane of anesthesia, and two, it has the, the zolazepam in there to try to smooth it out, even though it might take a little bit longer than, than if that wasn't the case. Dissociative drugs, um, this is ketamine or teletamine. Um, teletamine is the other half of or um, telazole, and so ketamine obviously is what's in MK um, or MKB or, or in sheep and goats, we just use xylazine uh, and ketamine, but they're dissociative drugs. They provide great pain relief, more so for muscle and bones than like your visceral or gut pain, but they can cause hallucinations. They're gonna cause an increase in your heart rate and blood pressure. So again, a really nice option if you, if you pair that with an opioid that balances those out. Um, they have increased in secretions and muscle Relaxant. So one thing about some of the ketamine, and we'll talk about the next group, is they can cause um, increased urination, which isn't really a big deal unless you're AI. So that's a, one way that we, one reason that we combined multiple drugs together so that we can use lower doses of each of them, because if a doe has a big bladder and it's sitting on top of the uterus when when they're trying to laparoscopically AI her, that can really get in the way of things. Um, and the big thing about ketamine or teletamine is there isn't a reversal. Um, and so once it's in that animal, the only way that it's gonna leave that animal is it, for that animal to metabolize it. Alpha-2s, it's um, just a type of receptor that they affect, but that's metatomidine uh, and xylazine. So that's your M and MK, your M and BAM, um, and then obviously xylazine or rompum as you might be familiar, and I put those arrows up there because metatomidine is, is, a, is a lot more potent than xylazine. And so 
you're going to get a strong sedation. You're going to get pain relief from it. Um, blood pressure originally goes up and then it drops and your heart rate's going to drop. Your respiration rate's going to drop. Um, you'll have increased urination, which uh, I like xylazine if I can get away with it mixed with other drugs versus metatonin just because again most of the time when I'm rocking an animal down it's because we're trying to lap AI them and you don't want a big bladder in that case. Um, and you can reverse these with adapamazole, yohimbine, or tolazine. So adapamazole is probably the most common because it's more potent and I think metatomidine at this point in the industry is more common than xylazine. So adapamazole is you're using that to reverse the metatomidine in your protocols. Uh, tolazine is also popular. Yohimbine used to be popular, um, but it affects epinephrine. And so the last thing that we really want in a deer that we're trying to wake up is, is a release of epinephrine. So um, I think adapamazole and tolazine are probably your common reversal agents. <clears throat> I think both of which have to be compounded now. And then uh, azaparone, which is uh, kind of in a category itself. That's the A in BAM. Um, it's a tranquilizer or sedation effect. Um, and again, uh, I think it, in my opinion, it helps kind of smooth the recovery process because we really don't reverse it. And um, it allows that animal to stay calm after it's been woken up from anesthesia. Uh, it has a oscillatory effect on respiration, a drop in blood pressure, and vasodilation, which um, originally started off as a pig drug, and one of the side effects when they would use it for pigs was hypothermia. And I think that that's how it transitioned into being used in the white cells is because, uh, it, because of the vasodilation, I think it does have a helpful effect on body temperature. So, um, we talk about a syncytial effect, and that uh, for a couple reasons. One, when we use drugs in combination safely, we can then use less of each of them, which might mitigate negative effects of some of them. Um, and then we can also use drugs that have varying effects to offset each other, like if we're using to help maintain steady blood pressure, steady heart rate, steady respiration rate. Um, and so you'll see a lot of combinations, and if you look at their effects on the body as far as blood pressure, heart rate, and respiration rate, they might offset each other to maintain a good balance. <clears throat> People always ask me my favorite, and I try not to, I don't think everything's black and white. I, I, I really have uses for all of them. As far as transporting animals or minor procedures, I think BAM is great. Um, I really do, it's, it's safe. I think you can use it in a lot of different species um, and it seems to be really effective and stable. It doesn't, in my opinion, provide surgical anesthesia and I think the board of anesthesiologists under the Veterinary Medical Association even released a statement saying that. So I don't like it for surgical procedures. I, um, just because of the level of anesthesia, I think we can be more humane to the animal and get a deeper level. Um, so if we are doing short surgical procedures or light surgery, um, that's when I'll move to MK or, recommend, or if people have MKB, which is a newer formulation, um, or XT, which is xylazine telazole. So um, <clears throat> I think those give you a humane level, reliable level of surgical anesthesia. A longer, more intense surgery, um, I like xylazine telazole. It's, a, it's probably the most potent formulation because of the telazole, and it's gonna give you your longest duration. Um, and then for reproduction, I like rompum telazole first, uh, MK next, and then we've used some MKB this last year, but um, rompum telazole is older. It's not as shiny and new as other products, but it's really reliable, and, uh, and we've had good success with it. So, um, yeah, again, there's, I have, I have a lot more familiarity with rompum telazole than the other ones, but uh, it just depends on what you're doing and, what, and what's going on that day on what I would recommend or what, what I think is appropriate to use. This is just a chart um, to try to wrap everything up so that you can reference it. It's got the class of drugs, the drug name, what we use it for. Um, adverse effects and then the reversals 
if there are any. So um, again, nothing new or earth shattering there, but just maybe something that's uh, concise that you can look at and reference if, if you need to. That's really, um, that's really all I have. So, unless y'all want to talk about antibiotics or fluids, I have those talks as well. Okay. All right. You won't hurt my feelings if you want to go do something else. I'll, I'll keep talking about antibiotics if people want to listen. Um, but again, if, um, so antibiotics really haven't been around for that long. Uh, 1928, a dude in London named Alexander Fleming, uh, laboratory scientist, had a reputation for being kind of messy and sloppy, went on vacation, came back, found something growing on his desk, um, and whenever he looked at it, he noticed that there was a ring uh, of no growth around a specific type of bacteria, and so he said, whoa, something is stopping this growth from happening, um, and that is, ended up being what we got penicillin from. So it all happened because somebody was messy in their lab and went on vacation. Uh, but when it came back, it ended up uh, that he accidentally and fortunately discovered penicillin. So this is a great quote. Muhammad Ali had a bunch of them. But he said, even if they can make penicillin out of moldy bread, surely they can make something out of you. So if you're ever having a bad day, uh, just think about that. And then this lady, I don't know who she was, but she must have farmed deer because she talks about death being an everyday occurrence before antibiotics. So um, they even contribute antibiotics to helping us win the Second World War. Um, so th things that soldiers would have died from in the First World War, they could address some of those issues with, with antibiotics. And so um, really powerful, powerful tool. Um, a lot more complicated than just grabbing Draxin and filling up a dart. And so we're going to walk through, walk through how I look at antibiotics and how I would hope that I can help y'all look at them too. So we'll talk about my approach to the selection, teach you about the different drug classes so that y'all can make some informed decisions and hopefully save time and be more efficient in treating stuff. Um, just an outline again of what we're gonna talk about. So before we treat, before we pick an antibiotic, we really need to understand what's going on with the animal to decide if an antibiotic is even warranted. So. Uh, Two main processes or where I maybe wouldn't go to an antibiotic first thing would be lameness, because that could be, a, it could be an injury. Um, an animal could be neurologic and look lame. Uh, you could have a mesquite thorn stuck in between the toes, which as long as that mesquite thorn is still there, just an antibiotic's not gonna help. You gotta actually remove the problem and then you can give an antibiotic as well. But so lameness is an issue that I don't just automatically go, we need an antibiotic right now. I think that we need to investigate a little bit. And then scours, we talked a lot about gut health and how important that microbiome is in the, in the gut. Um, and so really I think that nine times out of 10, uh, scours or diarrhea can be fixed with management um, instead of reaching for a, a bottle of antibiotics. So I try to talk to my clients about what can we do from a managerial standpoint um, before we just treat that animal with, with antibiotics. And then we also need to understand what type of infection because by definition antibiotics only work against uh, bacteria. They don't work against viral diseases, they don't work against fungus or protozoal. So we need to make sure that we have a bacterial infection that we're dealing with. Um, before we make a selection. It's also really helpful to know where in the body the problem is. We'll get into this later, but different antibiotics reach different parts of the body better or worse than others. How long has something been going on? Um, and using all of this to kind of paint just a big picture so that we can make a more informed decision than just Draxin. Um, and so this is a a sheet that I give to our clients or a reference. Um, I think it's really helpful to type one of these up at your house or write them down, laminate it, keep it in the ranger. And then if you're doctoring something in a pen, use a dry erase marker on that laminated sheet of paper. 
take a picture of it on your phone so you got it saved and then you can just wipe it off and write it down for the next one. And so you only got to have one sheet of paper and one dry erase marker and a cell phone and then you can keep pretty good records, email them to yourself or someone in the office. Uh, but it's always useful to know at least uh, respiration rate. You can sit there and count. Um, if you can get a heart rate, great. If you can get a temperature with a thermometer, that's great too, obviously, if they're knocked down. Um, but you can get a pretty good idea of how sick an animal is with the pair of binoculars looking at it and uh, just counting breaths and how laborious it looks when it's breathing. Um, so I have people write down, obviously, the date, ID, where it came from, estimated weight, clinical signs like hard breathing or fluffed hair, um, and then write down the drug, how much we gave, um, and how we gave it. And then I would encourage people to establish a recheck date, and you can do that easily with an alarm in your phone. So, you know, today is Saturday, you darted a deer, say Monday p.m., check on and, and hit that on your phone on your phone. When we talk about uh, antibiotics, we group them into families, and they're based off of a bunch of different ways and how we group them, but we group them based off of mode of action, and that's how they actually interact with the bacteria uh, on a molecular level, uh, and some of those do it differently. Most of them either attack the way that the bacteria is built um, or the bacteria DNA and we'll get into that a little bit. Then we talk about the spectrum of activity, meaning what type of bacteria that these different antibiotics are effective against. Um, some of them are really effective against respiratory bugs, um, and they don't do hardly anything for GI bugs and vice versa. So understanding their spectrum of activity, understanding where they go in the body. Uh, the biggest issues, I think, in the deer industry when we gotta take special consideration are joints um, and the brain. So there's only a few drugs that get into joints really, really well, and there's only a couple of drugs that can cross the blood-brain barrier. So if we have a neurologic animal, um, that's gonna change my recommendations to you because not every drug is gonna get there and do a good job for you. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about static versus cytal. Uh, I'm hesitant to mention that because it sounds like one's better than the other, and they're not, they're just different, but static drugs um, really contain an infection and then allow the immune system to come in and take over the bulk of the work. Cytal drugs actually kill the infection um, more or less independently. And again, that sounds like it's a better or worse type deal and it's not, it's just different and we can use that advantageously if we understand what's going on. Static uh, just holds it at bay, like holds it static. where it's not, And then it allows the immune system to come in and regain control um, versus cytal is something that more or less comes in and wipes it out. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit later why that's not always a good thing or why we, we don't go that route all the time. Go for it. Yeah. I'll hit on that in a little bit, and there's some little tips and tricks. In general, like that's probably above the scope of like everyday, I mean, that's like on a lab setting, but there's some, like, uh, luckily for us, like most of the bacteria in our lungs are gram negative, and so that's why exceed does well. Most of your skin bacteria are gram positive. Everything in your gut is what they call anaerobic, meaning it survives without oxygen. Same with abscesses. So luckily for us, as far as, and that's why I focus more on the, where the infection is in the body, because as far as treatment goes, most of those organisms tend to be very similar um, in whether or not they're gram positive or gram negative. So. Uh, Uh, it throws me off still. And to find out if it's gram positive or gram negative, you have to stain it and look at it on a slide, and it's blue or purple, and I'm colorblind, so it's, it was always confusing for me. So mode of action, uh, again, that's how these bacteria like actually interact with the bacteria. And so like I said, most of them damage the cell structure or the cell DNA. Um, the, Take home message from this slide is mycoplasma. Mycoplasma is a nasty, nasty uh, 
respiratory bug, um, and it doesn't have a cell wall. And so exceed, like we just talked about, and penicillin damage the cell wall of a bacteria. So obviously if mycoplasma doesn't have a cell wall, penicillin and exceed aren't gonna do anything for you. And so that's really important. Um, you obviously don't know just by looking at an animal with pneumonia if it's mycoplasma or not, but mycoplasma also causes some problems uh, in the inner ear. And so a lot of times if you have a mycoplasma and pneumonia, you'll start to notice like a dropped ear. Um, and then it also has a pathological process where it can cause swollen joints. So anytime I see pneumonia plus some funky looking ears or swollen joints, I automatically think mycoplasma. And so it's gonna change um, how I would treat that animal. And at the end of the slide, I wrap it all up and I have my recommendations uh, for different disease processes. And you'll notice that my first two go-to pneumonia drugs are both effective for mycoplasma so that we just cover that base um, already. But mycoplasma doesn't have a cell wall, so we don't want to use exceed or penicillin. Um, spectrum of activity, like we just talked about, uh, again, that's gram positive or gram negative, which is the way that the cell wall is built. <clears throat> and really, we're fortunate because most of the lung pathogens are gram negative. Like I said, most of the gut pathogens are gram positive, anaerobic. And then most of the skins are all, they're all really the same. So if we can pick a drug that gets there, uh, we're probably going to be okay. And then anaerobic and aerobic is just a descriptor of what type of oxygen environment that these animals live in. Obviously, the bacteria in our lungs are aerobic. They need oxygen, a, air to live. Um, and then if you think about our gut, there's no air in there. Um, and so those are anaerobic. Anything that smells really bad, like abscesses, those are anaerobic environments. And if you think about what happens to an abscess, it walls itself off from everything. There's no oxygen present. Um, and that allows those abscesses to grow, which is why a really good treatment option, the best for an abscess is to open it. It lets air get inside there. That's not the type of environment that those bugs thrive in. And so um, one of the simplest things to do for an abscess is to open it. Um, yep, so fuso bacteria, you know, lumpy jaw, or what we see in the f um, foot cases, a lot of those are, are anaerobic bacteria. And so not all drugs get that. I have it in a chart, the ones that do, but just something to think about. Tissue, tissue distribution, um, pretty important one. Fortunately for deer farmers, almost all of these drugs reach the lungs relatively well. Some of them do exceedingly well, but most of them do. Um, get to the lungs. The GI tract, uh, if I, because of what we talked about scours in the first place, I really think you need to get your hands on that animal at, at worst. Um, and then if you are going to treat them with an antibiotic, I'd, I'd, I'd go orally. You know, it gets right there versus a dart having to go through systemic circulation, through the blood flow, and then into the gut. So if it's a scours case, I recommend oral antibiotics for those. Make sure that we don't have a parasite problem. It could be intestinal worms, um, it could be coccidia or something like that that's causing scours, which isn't going to be uh, helpful uh, with an antibiotic. Skin, almost all of these get to the skin really well, but I like white antibiotics for the skin just because they cover, the, they cover that spectrum pretty well. And then joints, really, really tough to get into. And so um, for joints, I go to macrolides, which is your Draxin, Zactrans, Aprevo. Again, I have all of that in a slide, or one concise chart at the end, or a new floor. Um, new floor is not dartable, but I think if you have swollen joints, you probably need to look at that animal on the ground anyways. <clears throat> and then your blood-brain barrier. Polyflex, which is ampicillin, which is like a potential, it's like a potent penicillin. Batril or Nuflor are really your only drugs that cross the blood-brain barrier uh, well. So if you have a neurologic animal um, that you come across, I see it commonly after cutting antlers. Um, depending on how antler cut goes, I think that you either get a descending infection through the antlers or maybe microfractures at the base of the antler from the sawzall. And so, uh, I have guys that commonly call me or talk to them and they have you know, staggering bucks after a couple of days after antler cut um, and we could be, mess could be dealing with uh, an infection there and so 
at that point, I point them to one of these three drugs because really, Batril or Nuflor, because they're long-acting, Polyflex is an every 24-hour drug. Um, so again, if you're going to take pictures of a slide, I got one. I can give it to you now so you can look at it. But um, it's kind of small. I can send it to you. But this is everything that we're going to talk about in one chart that you can look at. Um, so, and I can, if y'all shoot me an email, if you wrote it down or you have it there, I can email you these slides, but so that y'all don't have to go crazy writing stuff down. This is everything in one table. And then, let's see. Uh, this is my general recommendations too, as far as in order of priority when you're gonna, if you're treating stuff. and go um, so tissue dish water versus lipid soluble um, that might be beyond the scope of everyday language but basically that's a measure of how well drugs move through membranes um, like those when we talk about the joints or the blood brain barrier we don't deal with it in deer but prostate uh, the prostate blood barrier is really hard to penetrate and so um, but that's really just how well they move through membranes. And uh, your fat-soluble drugs are going to be the ones that get into the membranes better than others. We talked about this a little bit, bacteriostatic versus bactericidal. Um, the only two times that I think that this, three times, that I think this might come into play is uh, if we have a really sick animal, our tendency in the deer industry is to use high concentration of dexamethasone to dart something when it's sick. Dexamethasone is an immunosuppressive drug. And so in my mind, if we're using high compound dex um, and we're going to use an antibiotic, I would use a cytal antibiotic, which they're listed in that, in that chart that I sent you, because we're low in the immune system of that animal when we give it dexamethasone. So like if I was going to use dexamethasone for a case, I'd probably follow up with like Batril or Exceed, because both of those are cytal. Um, uh, unless it's penicillin, I give most of these drugs a 72-hour window to work. Um, I honestly, it sounds cruel, and I know that everything changes when you're looking at how much a deer costs, but I, I think you're not doing any good if you treat something earlier than that, if you use a long-acting drug. So you got to give the drug time to work. And if you gave a deer Draxin today and it died tomorrow, I don't think that there's any amount of antibiotic you could have given it this afternoon that would have saved it. I just, so, um, and I, I talked about that as far as like just day one, treat something, recheck on day three or four. If, it's, if it looks better, you're good. If it looks the same, I would retreat. If it doesn't look any better, uh, I'm sorry, if it looks worse, then I would change drugs. But I, I usually go like one, day one, day three, day four, day six. That's kind of how my approach with, uh, with retreatments. Fawns, we talked a lot about how they don't really have a robust immune system. So I like Exceed for fawns because it gets almost everywhere in the body and it's cytal. Um, Batril is also a cytal like we talked about, but Batril can cause um, joint malformations in young animals so, or cartilage defects. So I'm a little bit leery of using Batril in young animals. And so for fawns, Exceed is something that I consider first, depending on what we're working with. And then this, the central nervous system, uh, you don't really have an immune system per se, like you do in the rest of your body in your CNS. And so if I have those neurologic animals, Batril is something that I look at, um, at new floor secondly. But um, so those are really the only times that I think that that comes in. But the biggest one, in my opinion, for the deer industry is uh, Reevaluating our drug selection when we're using uh, high comp high potency dexamethasone. So, uh, this is just a, a little bit of language and verbiage because people always ask what dose or dosage or how much, and, and it changes. Um, but a dosage is a rate, like mileage, miles per hour. So dosage is usually given as um, milligrams per kilogram. So milligram amount of the drug versus the weight of the animal. 
dose is the actual amount of the drug that's given. So if um, down here, if I have a 100 pound deer and I'm gonna use one mg per pound of dexamethasone, the dose of dex that that deer is gonna get is 100 milligrams, because we're doing 100 milligrams per pound. Volume is how much it's actually filled into the dart, and that's based off of the concentration. So you can see here, our dosage for this deer is one milligram per pound. The dose, because of our dose, is gonna be 100 milligrams. Does that make sense? So, and then our volume is gonna depend on what, what our dex is compounded at. So if we have 24 mg per mil dex, that's roughly gonna be four cc's to get us to that 100, versus if someone had 96 mg per mil dex, it's just gonna get one cc. So it's all the same. Same dosage, one mg per pound, same dose, it's 100 milligrams, and the only thing that changes is the volume based off of, so, because I had one guy that told me that his buddy was crazy because he was given four cc's of dexamethasone to these bucks during EHD, and I was like, well, what's, it? and it turns out that this was the, that's why I used this, so he had super, super compounded dex, he was only having to use one cc, his buddy was using four cc's, but it's because his wasn't very potent, so they were getting the same amount, just a different size dart, if that makes sense. But do you always use compounded dex? Yeah. Uh, to, I mean, I don't know that you need to go, you know, off the shelf dexamethasone is two milligrams. Yeah. Uh, and, so, but I think that, I think you can safely go one time up to one mg per pound. So, you know, that would be 50 cc's of, of the two mg per mil dexamethasone. So as far as darting animals, um, that's why we started, and I say we, that's why pharmacy started compounding dex was so that it could, you could get an efficacious dose in a dart. Um, so, but I, I had a cow that was down last year and you know, I gave her like 100 cc's of the, I mean, I just, cause it was only two mg per mil and she was a big cow, but so, um, yeah, I did, I, and she died, but uh, I gave her the whole bottle anyways. So, uh, but yeah, that's, um, we just compounded so that it can fit into a dart. We'll actually get into some of the drug classes now. So cephalosporins, um, the way that I've structured these slides is the name of the drug group at the top, then we have the trade names or drug names, like what you're gonna ask for when you're ordering something. Um, I tried to tell you if it was long or short acting, large or small volume, really, if it's dartable or not. Um, water or lipid soluble, static or cidal, and then what it does here. At the bottom, I've told you what it's actually labeled for. As a veterinarian, I can't give you off-label recommendations, but, but so I've, I've told you what they're labeled for, and then I've bolded what I think that they do well. And then at the bottom, I've told you where they reach the body. So cephalosporins, you have Exceed, Naxel, XNL. Exceed, far and away, the most common in the deer industry. Um, it's small volume and it's long acting. Naxel and XNL are, are great drugs, but they're every 24 hours. So we use them in a hospital setting when we can give stuff every day. But as far as treating a deer, um, Exceed is what we'd go to because I think it gives you 72 hours at least of protection. Small volume, you can dart it. Um, and if you, have, if you need to cut it a little bit with saline, you can, but it, you can dart Exceed. Um, again, it does, it goes for the cell wall, so this isn't something we would use for mycoplasma, and it's not great for anaerobic bacteria, so I don't use it for smelly, uh, for lack of better, I don't use it for smelly infections, um, but it is a great respiratory drug. It's good for mastitis if you have a, a utter infection in your dose. Um, it's a white antibiotic, so I think that's how I classify skin antibiotic or skin antibiotics, just it's easy for people to remember penicillin or exceed for the skin. Um, and it does get into the central nervous system, so this is a, an option for that. And by and large, it reaches almost everywhere in the body relatively well, so it's a great drug, um, so, except for mycoplasma and anaerobes. Penicillin, this is what started antibiotics. Um, it's like a weaker cousin to uh, the cephalosporins, but still great drugs. Um, Penicillin or polyflex is what we would uh, be comfortable with. Polyflex is interesting because it comes lyophilized, and so you can mix it to the strength that you want. And so it gives an option to dart it. 
penicillin is really probably three cc's per hundred, maybe six, depending on what you're fighting. So it's not as dartable, but you can mix polyflex as potent as you want it so you can fit it into a dart. Um, they're short acting though. Those are every 24 hour drugs and uh, they attack the cell wall like cephalosporin. So again, not something we'd want to use for mycoplasma, but they're great for skin. Um, orally, they're really good for GI infections. Like you can get uh, powdered penicillin to put in your water and uh, they're good for the repro tract and central nervous system. But again, it's, they're every 24 hours. So uh, that's probably their rate limiting use in the deer industry is how often you need to give it to be effective. Macrolides. Um, far and away the most common drug class for the deer industry because they're really good drugs and they're dartable. So that's Draxin, Zactran, Zaprevo, Mycotil. Um, they're great for mycoplasma. They're long acting, small volume. You can dart them. Thailand is powdered so you can put it in water. Um, if you have pneumonia outbreaks, they're lipid, soluble, and static. Uh, so they reach all tissues, especially the lungs. Great, as you know, for respiratory and foot rot. Um, my one thing with Draxin, or with Macrolides, and I say Draxin because I think it's the most common, is um, I can't think of any disease process, like just off the top of my head, where I would recommend using two antibiotics at the same time, like in general. And so I, on Facebook, I see a lot of people throwing out recommendations and they may list three of these for the same treatment. And if one of these doesn't work, then the other one's not gonna work. And so save yourself the time and money and just pick one of these and just use it. Um, if you want to, to feel better, you can pick a drug from a different, again, I don't I wouldn't recommend that because um, I just can't think of a disease process where I, I think that we should give more than one. Um, but certainly don't give more than one for the same from the same family of drugs because you're not doing yourself. And if one of these works really well, then the other one's not gonna help it anymore either. So um, just pick one and use it. And if it doesn't work, then none of the other ones are going to either. Tetracyclines, uh, I would say these are probably the second oldest group of antibiotics. This is your LA200 or 100, 200 to 300, or biomycin. I've bolded biomycin because um, that's what we use. I think it has a, a more tissue friendly carrier so you don't have as many tissue reactions when you give it. Um, long acting, it's a moderate volume, not dartable, um, but uh, it's broad spectrum, long acting. It's good respiratory drug. It's good for foot rot. They make oral formulations. So CTC that you get in your feed is a tetracycline and it gets to all tissues really well except into your, your blood brain barrier. Fluoroquinolones, um, also, uh, I, if you're gonna rank them as far as potency and power, fluoroquinolones, that's a high-powered class of drugs. Uh, Batra will be your most popular. I'm an advocate for Advacin because it's uh, very similar to Batra, but it's about half the volume um, because of how it's formulated. So you can dart Advacin uh, relatively easily in a full-grown deer, and that gives you another option. I just, I look at it as options to treat a full-grown deer because we need more than just Draxin. So you can dart Draxin, you can dart Exceed, you can dart Advacin. So that gives you three different drug classes to pick from if you're treating a sick, a mature deer in a pen with a dart gun. Um, great for respiratory disease, great for mycoplasma. So this is one that we could go to safely as a first line defense against pneumonia. Um, it gets into the lungs and it gets into the brain. So uh, again, just this one, be careful when using it in small animals because of the cartilage defects. I had a lady when I was a fourth year at A&M brought me a baby goat that had pneumonia and its legs were fused like this. She had overdosed it in Batril and all of the joints were, I mean, we had to euthanize it because it, it could never walk again because it was overdosed on, on Batril because of, um, so just be careful. That was an extreme story, but that just shows you what it can do. doesn't stunt their growth, it just, your cartilage is a cushion between bone on bone and that inhibits the cartilage formation. So when they're walking, they just get bone on bone. That if, if that happens, that produces really bad arthritis and then that's when you can get lasting joint, joint problems. 
sulfa drugs. Um, this would be Albon, sulfa dimethoxine, or like your calf boluses. Uh, these can only be given orally or IV. Can't give it under the skin or in the muscle. Um, really good for scours because this is the one asterisk where an antibiotic is effective against a different type of bug. So sulfa dimethoxine works for coccidia as well. And coccidia is actually a protozoa, not a bacteria. Um, and so always use these with thymine because it's going to because it disrupts the gut flora. So if I'm using, if I'm giving anything orally to an animal, um, I recommend that they give thymine as well because uh, thymine is a, is a min vitamin that uh, the bugs in the gut produce. It's needed for healthy neural function. Um, if you disrupt that flora and you don't have adequate supply of thymine, that's when you get polio. And so anytime we're, we're doing something that could disrupt the gut, uh, I recommend giving thymine, especially to young animals because they don't have the capacity to make it like a mature animal does. Fluorophenicol, I told you earlier I don't, I try not to pick favorites, but new fluor is my favorite drug. Um, it's just not dartable, but um, it gets everywhere in the body. It's great against mycoplasma. It's long lasting in the joints. Um, and so it's great for pneumonia, for foot rot, for neurological signs. Resflora is new flora with banamine already mixed in it, which is a, a useful tool if <clears throat> it's one less needle that you have to give. So, but the only downside in the deer industry to res or to new flora and resflora is uh, you have to give it by hand. You can't dart it. It's like honey. Banamine won't, but dexamethasone can, depending on the stage of pregnancy. You can even cut new flora with saline and darts? It's six cc's per 100 pounds. So uh, if you had a big enough dart and a small enough animal, you could. Uh, but because of, it's kind of volume limited, because it's six cc's per 100, um, as far as the labeled dose. No, sir. Not yet. I think they have to, I don't understand all the patent laws, but I think that they can't compound something until a pat. I think that that's how it works. Sir? Yeah, on this uh, uh, new floor, you've got not good for darting, and that's, it's thick, and it doesn't work too good. Yes, sir. Uh, but can you kind of warm it up, heat it up a little bit, and, and uh, make it work? I know that when it's warm, it's, we had a, we would set ours next to a heater, like at the cattle clinic in the winter, um, just so that we could actually draw it up into a syringe. So I don't know how warm it would have to be to be liquid so enough. Instead of using new floor, what else would you use? I mean, what, what other? For a pneumonia case? or yeah. pneumonia, Draxin? Um, yeah, so. Um, you, you know, we use some reaction on pneumonia cases, and it gets to a point where it's really not, doesn't seem to be getting that much better. So, what, you know, the next step? I would, uh, I would probably invest, explore Advacin. Um, if, if, you're, if you're strictly wanting something that you can dart, um, because, or exceed, but I, I tend to use exceed second or as a backup, just in case we're messing with mycoplasma as an ammonia, because um, Advacin is dartable and it's going to be effective against mycoplasma. And so if Draxin's not working, that's a really good go-to because it's going to get you the same coverage um, and you can dart it. And then if, if that doesn't work, then I would move to exceed after that. But I like the fact that you pay attention enough and have good enough knowledge knowing that Draxin doesn't seem to be working anymore. And that's why on this slide, I've tried to space out. You'll notice that macrolides or Draxin is my only first recommendation for one category because we're going to reach a point in the industry where we've used Draxin so much for so many different things that it doesn't work anymore. And so part of my recommendations is to try to reserve use for the different drugs um, to where I think they're most important. So. If we're right here on a pneumonia for 
Macrolides or Draxin, and this doesn't work anymore, then I would move second to Addison. So um, just because it's going to give you the same coverage and you can dart it. Yeah. So this is, I call this my plan. So drug one, day one. You dart an animal. <clears throat> Just one drug. You come back on day three or day four. If that animal is healed, you're done. You cross it off, you fix that animal. If that animal looks the same, no improvement, but it's not worse, I would retreat with the same drug. If that animal's worse, I would pick a totally unrelated drug. I wouldn't go from like Draxin to Zactran. I would go from Draxin to a totally different class of drugs. Um, because like I said, Draxin, Zactran, Mycotil, they're all so closely related that if one of them's not working, the other one's not gonna work either. And so um, that's when I would go to, I think I have. Mm -hmm. Sir? Let's say you're running, you know, two, three, four deer with of pneumonia. Yes, sir. In your first. So, uh, is it a wise idea to use the medicated feed uh, to as preventative? Yeah, so you. It's not good for the the gut bacteria. That's that's why that's what I'm asking. Yeah, you can definitely. I mean, there's you can use it. I know that it's efficacious. Um, you can use it as a preventative for sure. Uh, there's a drug called Thailand, which is basically, for lack of a better, it's like powdered Draxin. Um, and you can treat the water. It's a five-day treatment. And so depending on, the only problem with medicated feed is if you're starting to see a problem and you want to treat everybody, you got to order a whole new, you might have to order a whole new bin of feed, but you may have you may only be half empty at the farm right now. So logistically, medicated feed can be an issue. So I, I think that water is a good option. So this is a formulation. Um, and you can call me if it's a different scenario. But this is one where you can treat a whole pen with a, a tub of Thailand just by mixing it in the water every day. It's a little bit labor intensive because you got to make sure that they don't have automatic water that week. Um, but instead of having to order a whole new bulk bin of feed that's medicated and treating everybody that may not need it, if you have a pin. Well, we, we have the ability, we have ventures. Oh, okay. We have the ability to uh, uh, not order a bulk order. Okay. Just, you know, say a thousand pounds or something, you know, and, and uh, use that individually. Then, then yeah, that's a, if, if you know, you know, there's certain times of the year and certainly if rain's sparse one year and your dust is coming earlier and it's getting hot, then yeah, if, I, I would use it as a preventative. So it's not something that I think people should have year round in every pen, but if, depending on what the year is like, um, it's always, it can be different, but yeah, if, if it's warranted, then I'm all for uh, using it as a preventative. Similar, a diff different drug, but LS50 works too. This is, LS50 uh, works well too, um, but Thailand, I, you, I have formulations for both, but I've been using Thailand lately because it comes in a big tub that's easy to mix instead of a bunch of little bitty bottles. So you would prefer that one over the Yeah, and it, I think it works well, so. I use LS50 for uh, like gut issues. If um, so, there's some farms that, based on the way that they feed animals, pulling them off feed for AI and then putting back on can cause some clostridium issues. LS50 is great for that. Um, for a respiratory case, I go more towards Thailand. Um, we talked about no lincosamides is a uh, Spectragard or LS50, neomycin the same. These are both oral syrups. Um, 
good for scours if, if you decide with your veterinarian that that's warranted. And again, use them with thymine. This was my general recommendation side, so um, I'll kind of explain my thought process. I still think Draxin's a great drug, and if it works for pneumonias, I would still use it as a first-line defense. If you're at that point where it doesn't, move to Advacin, because it gives you the same spectrum of activity, and it's also dartable. Third line would be Exceed. Still dartable, but you don't get mycoplasma, so that's why I have, I have it last. Skin wounds, I put Exceed first. It, great coverage, it's dartable. Um, and it's long acting. Penicillin is also great, but it's every 24 hours and not as dartable. Um, for foot rot or fuso, I think you need to knock that animal down. Um, but for foot cases or joints, New Floor is my favorite drug, um, just based off of how well it gets into joints. Uh, we did a study, they did a study at AM where they put, um, they gave some calves New Floor in the muscle. Um, and then they put a tourniquet on some of them, put new floor in the vein so that it, the pressure built up and it forced it into the joints. They went back a couple of days later, tested the antibiotic level and the same exact antibiotic level in the joint just from a shot as far as um, what they had to do to actually force it into the joint. So new floor is great for joints. Uh, neurological activity or antler infection, um, Batril or new floor. You could use Advacin if you wanted to dart it, um, but if you're gonna put your hands on those animals and give it fluids or, or dex or anything like that, um, then you can go ahead and use something that's not as easily dartable. And then scours, management first. And then we can talk about oral antibiotics if we need to. Uh, this is just that formulation that I was talking about. Basically, you take a, a tub of Thailand and you mix it into two gallons of water. And then um, basically it's like a Gatorade bottle of water per 50 gallons. Um, water trough for five days and, and that's a pretty good treatment for when you got a big problem and you can't run the whole pen through. Again, get a plan together so that we know what's working. Um, space it out. I give them 72 hours on the long acting drugs. Have a foot rot protocol, have a scours protocol. <clears throat> this is my table that just copied small but like I said I can get it to you but I, I did the same thing like on the knockdown drugs. You have your drug class here, the brand names, long or short acting, small or large voluble, what it's good for, and then what it's not good for. Um, so I have guys that print these off and laminate them and you can tape them to like the stock of a dart gun or put them in the Ranger. Um, and so you can reference that if you need to.